actually really glad to be doing it. I think it's been like <laughs> first time in well over a decade. Hello, welcome to Jason Cabin Experience. Today we're here with Amy. Amy, thanks for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it as well. So, Amy, um, we're going to talk about your business, 17 years old, in a minute. But first, I want to ask you, does it seem like most entrepreneurs like start doing entrepreneurial stuff as an early age? Like you see kids like selling lemonade cans, cutting grass, you know, is this something like you're just born with an entrepreneur, you think? I, I guess so. I mean, I, I feel like I kind of fought it for as long as I could, because when I did have my first business, I was working 80 hours a week during my summers in high school. And that that was just rough. So I feel like I fought it. But um, honestly, I think, yeah, a lot of people, if they see that they have that special ability to make money in a unique way, they jump in and do it versus going down the traditional paths. So it was a candy shop at 17, your first entrepreneurial business? Yeah, definitely. And and the thing is, is my mom was, um, she owned, she owned a fabric store that competed with Joanne fabrics that had global appeal in the middle of like a small town in Ohio. My dad was a traveling salesman. And so I had, I think that when you're a traveling salesman, you're very entrepreneurial as well. And then my dad eventually started his own business later in life. So I think that I had a lot of, um, you know, great examples in life that got me into it. But starting the candy store was an accident. It was not actually an intentional, hey, I'm going to go out and do this. Um, it was a candy store that already existed. It was a candy store, an ice cream parlor in the middle of a summer vacation. Um, so it was actually I say it was resort. An, actual, an actual building? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like a lemonade stand. You just sit something down on the front house, front yard. No. It, up, so a of candy. it was a thousand square foot oh, building wow. that's still there. And every few years, somebody else takes it over. Um, and my dad was in charge of finding the new um, proprietor for it. And so I joked and said I would do it because I didn't think he'd take a 17-year-old seriously. And then he woke me up the next morning at, oh, a god awful early hour for a Saturday morning and took me to Key Bank to get a business loan. So did you get a discount? <laughs> <laughs> I <don't> On a leash. <laughs> well, luckily, even even with the setup that they had, it was um it, it was a setup where I think the lease was a dollar. <laughs> oh wow, okay. And then at the end of it, you just give give it right back to the park after owning it for a couple of years. So the whole idea is once we had it, then we could do whatever we wanted with the space. And I say we, because it was definitely my dad's childhood dream come true. <laughs> so he had a lot of ideas. And was this just during the summertime? You was actually going to school while this is going on? It was a park that was only open um, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Okay. So it kind of worked out perfectly. And um, at 17, I um, moved into a family owned cottage about two blocks away from the store and spent my summers living there. Um, which was pretty cool too, because I was kind of independent and on my own for that time. So this would be an ice cream parlor down on Olympia, right? Called Grandfather's Ice Cream. And it was, it had the best ice cream ever. It was always closed on Sundays, but the guy, only his grandkids worked in there, right? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to do what, if you're my grandkid, you work here from ninth to 12th grade, I'll pay for your college. Oh, nice. I mean, that was a rumor. You know, it was always his grandkids in there, right? Uh -huh. the best ice cream, right? I think they closed down a couple years ago after COVID, yeah. That's cool. So, for the business is this not the closing down of school. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so did you, was your, your idea to do a candy store or like your dad's idea? How'd that come about? It was a penny candy store to begin with it. it so this was in a park that I think started around like 1880, 1890, uh, a family park of cottages. My great, great grandpa built a lot of the cottages in the park. It's on the lake, uh, on Lake Erie in Ohio. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. So it's about 40 minutes away from where I grew up. Um, and basically it had always been something. It was a soda fountain for a while, um, a general store for a while. And when I grew up, um, it was a penny candy store where I could show up with a quarter and walk away with a crazy bag of candy. And then by the time I was a teenager, the penny candy store concept had kind of dwindled because it wasn't all that profitable for a real adult, but I wasn't a real adult. So I went back and focused on penny candy, but I also introduced a cappuccino machine and made it a coffee shop um, and then really just kind of focused on making it that place where families could go have fun and their kids could just kind of be dropped off um, while the parents would just go relax at their cottage. So in a sense, I was a glorified babysitter as well. <laughs>
it was a setup like a traditional 1950s soda pop setup, setup like you know, like, like you see in Happy Days and yeah. like those kind of shows. Yeah, it was, it's very, it's it still is to this date, uh, very traditional. Um, and it's it's, I don't know, there there's this great um, feeling of innocence when you go there. And so my goal was to maintain that. So the other big thing I did was constantly played Motown. I played not like just. You know, it was the late 90s. There was no grunge being played, even though I might have wanted to listen to it. I was constantly making sure everything I was playing was 50s and 60s music the whole time, too. Yeah. So how long did this last, like from 17 or 20 or? No, just uh, my junior year and my senior year of high school. And then I went to college. Okay. So it was kind of an agreement from the start that once college came, I would go away to college and not um, not be coming back and running it during my summers. So what lessons do you learn from the experience that you carry with yourself today? A lot, honestly. I mean, I think the biggest thing about the job was, um, and I say job because I, I didn't even realize how entrepreneurial it was until I had to sit down and pay all the taxes about <laughs> eight months later. Um, and luckily, my dad had helped me keep some really clean books, and that made sure that we knew what we were paying in taxes. And I had hired um, I had hired friends of mine from high school to be my employees, so that was kind of cool too. Um, but I think like the biggest lesson I took away, and still to this day believe, is you need to work more than your employees work. That if you're the one taking home the big amount of money, then it's your job to put in the most hours, and you also need to know every role in the business and be able to perform every role. That way, you can hold your employees accountable as well. Isn't it crazy how a lot of people out there own a business and they'll say, you know, my employees are not invested like I am. Yeah. Of course they're not. Exactly. They don't own the company. Like, exactly. Are you kidding me? Right? Or exactly. they're not working long enough. They're not long enough. Are you kidding me right now? Do you hear yourself? I don't get that. That that was always my biggest issue anywhere I worked is I would always see, except for one job, I would always see the CEO leave before me. And it just drove me nuts because I kept thinking, what are you doing to inspire me to stick around and work? into the evening <clears throat> and work weekends, et cetera. What are you doing to inspire that if you're just checking out at three o'clock every single day? So when I started my company, I promised myself that I would be the last one to leave um, and that I would make sure that my employees saw that if they were overwhelmed or burned out, I'd take the workload off of them and take that on myself. And I also made sure that I didn't hire somebody unless I had already spent a decent amount of time doing their job first. Because that way I could actually, you know, speak to them with a full understanding of what they were going through instead of just what I see a lot of companies do, not take the time to learn somebody's job and then critique their job and critique how they're doing, <laughs> how they're doing their job when you don't even understand the issues that can go on during it. Yeah, I, don't, I think a lot of bosses don't realize how much like people like mirror what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. If you say late, they're going to say late. If you leave yep. early, they're going to leave early, right? Exactly. If you treat people like shit, they're going to treat people like shit, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's crazy. So next, talk about your career in film and marketing. Mm -hmm. So um, my career in film was pretty short-lived. Uh, I went to film school. So film was what I just absolutely loved. You want to be an actress, a director? No, producer, director, director, director. Director. I kept telling people. So you want to tell people what to do. Yeah. Even from then. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. I kept telling people I was going to be the next Steven Spielberg. And I, you know, wanted to write scripts and direct my own scripts. And I wanted to do documentaries. Um, and I definitely, you know, got a few very bad scripts out there. Um, and I definitely made a number of, you know, short films and a, a very bad feature length film once that never saw the light of day. Um, so I, I did learn quickly that there were two things I loved about film. The first thing was the directing role. I, I loved that aspect of kind of seeing the full vision and having a team help put that creative vision together. And then the other thing I loved was editing. I could not just see that kind of vision at the start, but I, I understood what it would take to execute the final um, end product. And I found out that I just really loved that idea of, you know, stitching together every little piece of content to put together a full narrative. And so when I moved out here to Seattle in 2004, um, I got into a job where we were, um, surveying people in the middle of the mall and after um, exit polls, after movies, getting their opinions on um, 
whether a movie trailer actually told them what the movie was and got them excited about it. And if it didn't, then what edits had to be done to that movie trailer to actually get people excited or um, having people come out of the movies and tell us what worked and what didn't. Um, So that was a lot of fun, but I started to learn through all of that, that I really liked marketing. So I ended up, um, because marketing was such a huge aspect of that role, um, I ended up doing some film editing for about a year, um, mobile video on demand. Uh, This was before the iPhone. And this was when, you know, people would just on their flip phone download a 3G, just pixelated as all hell video. And it was my job to edit those. Um, But the primary audience were 17 year old boys. So you can imagine the type of content I was constantly editing and I wanted out of that. Um, (laughs) So I segued entirely into marketing and um, fell in love with marketing. And when I started um, Killer Infographics, which became Killer Visual Strategies, it was that perfect combination. It was the visual storytelling aspect I loved about film and everything I loved about marketing combining into one. And I got to be the director. So it really kind of hit every passion I've ever had and brought it into one space. For being the director, was there certain genre of movies you want to do? Like you want to do horrors, adventure, comedy, or just you just wanted to direct movies? I kind of just wanted to direct movies, but I will be honest, um, never horror. Um, I think that requires a very specific skill for the jump scare that I just don't have the capability to do um, because horror movies scare me too much. So I'm not passionate about them enough because they give me nightmares, um, despite my love of Hitchcock. Um, But yeah, I mean... Probably more like dramas and documentaries. I think those were the things I've always been interested in. But I would say that's also because I can't write a good joke to save my life. So um, I also think comedy just requires such a skilled mind to write and to really properly film to ensure that you're getting the right level of sarcasm in even just how you're filming somebody, even their looks, catching the right looks from them and things like that. Yeah. So... So back to the movies, mm-hmm. I could be wrong. Isn't our website, I think it's called IDMP, IDMB, where everyone has done a movies on there. Internet movie database, I IMDB. So. Yeah. Are you on there? I'm on there. I, I'm, no, I'm not on there um, because I've never actually put something out that, okay. um, that anybody other than my college class saw. Um, there is a DVD of a bunch of my stuff okay, so, hiding so, in my house. So we can't find your movie on there? No, no, not at all. <laughs> so no linking it to the show notes or nothing like that? <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Um, but I will say I am on IMDb every single day yeah. because I'm always watching something and trying to figure out where did I see that person from? So it is my most used app on my phone. <laughs> so how long will you fall on this career path as a director? Oh, not super long because my dad instilled a lot of practicality in me from day one and kept saying to me, if you're going to major in film, you need to minor in something a little bit more practical. So I minored in marketing. Um, So I always kind of knew that's what I wanted. And when I moved out here, um, I actually lived up the street. I moved um, to a place on 2nd and Yesler that was live work artist housing. It was HUD subsidized Um, because at the time, you know, my income was next to nothing. Yeah, I Um, used to bust there sometimes. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Um, I used to just walk my dog in the little triangle there. Um, And yeah, basically... I moved into that live work artist housing and part of the agreement was you have to keep working on your art. So my first year here, I was hardcore working on um, trying to put together a documentary and um, did the 24 hour um, film festival where, you know, you have 24 hours to make a film with a key group of people. And then after 24 hours, the next day, you're showing all the films and everybody votes. So I did that two years in a row. That was a lot of fun. Um, but then I met, um, my wife about a year and a half into living here and realized I needed a nine to five. <laughs> like I needed to grow up a bit by that. So from experience, what makes a good movie? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, everybody has a very different viewpoint on that. Um, and I think that is the whole idea The there's this concept in film called the willing suspension of disbelief. The idea that if you can sit in front of that screen and stop questioning the reality it's presenting to you and just go all in, 
it's got to be a good movie in that way. It's, it's, it's pulling you in and it's giving you an emotional response. Now, for some people, that could be Barbie, for instance. Um, the world building in Barbie is pretty darn amazing because you can't poke holes in it. Um, and so I found that to be really brilliant. And I felt like there had, must have been years of thought that went into just that world building alone. Um, whereas there are other movies I'll walk away from thinking, well, here's about 50 plot holes. And I couldn't even get into the movie because I was too focused on the bad plot decisions. Um, and filmmaking is very important as well. I mean, what type of ang what type of angles is the, is the director using? And are those angles intentional to drive emotion? Or is it just because the director thought it was cool at the time? And you can kind of tell the difference when you're watching something to tell if somebody is really novice or if somebody really is living and breathing what they're creating in that moment. Um, and it is the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's the other important aspect of it. It does seem like if a movie is like good, it's a universal, right? Like for example, the movie Tombstone. I mean, I don't think, I don't know anyone who says Tombstone's a bad movie, right? right? Everyone loves Tombstone, right? Yeah. An opposite thing, like uh, the movie um, Thor, uh, what's the Thor, Love and Thunder, they did a couple years ago. Uh-huh. If, if that's not the worst movie of all time, it's in the bottom five, right? Like, a guy, Christian, what, like, how do you even, like, agree to do this movie, right? They right. must pay, like, billions of dollars. Or, or you must have been a contract, you had to make one horrible movie while I'm all right. It, it was so bad, right? And, like, so I, I watched it on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. Even then, I felt like I ripped off. <laughs> I don't know if you watched it or not, but yeah, it was bad. I did not. I, I hit a point where I said I don't have the energy to keep up with the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided I couldn't commit to it anymore. Yeah, so. the Marvel Universe. Now you got the uh, Star Wars Universe. Right. Also, uh, I can't commit to it. I'm trying to. Like, I, I, I just finished watching the Soka series. Mm -hmm. Like, do you really need, like, a Boba Fett, the bounty hunter guy? Like, I don't know about that, you know? Or right. Lorne, yeah, I don't know. Like, it, exactly. It, it's a lot. Exactly. So any any desires any like maybe any like you know, like like a um, insights to go back directing anytime like do as a hobby or something like maybe like make a short film or something? Yeah, I do actually have a lot of desire to um, maybe write a script or two. Um, I think that that is also one of the things I learned in the whole process is to work in LA where you're really creating film to be a part of that industry. Um, it requires a very huge commitment and it requires for, you know, somebody to move all the way up the chain. You don't just start up the chain, no matter how talented you are. And so I don't have that in me anymore. I, I, I mean, my twenties and thirties went to uh, running killer. Um, I don't have it in me to just try something like that again, but I do think it could be fun to write a couple of scripts and uh, see if I can get any interest in selling a script or two, something like that. So I think LA, well, Hollywood, mm -hmm. Atlanta, Jordan, New York, like the like yeah. the film hubs. Are there any film hubs in the United States out there? I mean, one of the reasons I moved to Seattle was because at the time it was the um, largest place for women in film. Okay, I didn't know. Um, it's one of the places that really validates um, women in film at a time where in early 2000, it was very hard for women to get recognized for filmmaking. Um, and so when I moved out here, there was a really good community and that was a huge part of why I came out here. And I met people far more talented than me. And I think that's one of the things that I've always um, been happy to, um, I mean, never ashamed of in my life, I guess I should say. Like, it's very easy for me to recognize when somebody's more talent, talented than me and then focus on building that person up instead of trying to, you know, make up raw talent that doesn't exist. Because a lot of filmmaking is raw talent first and then honing that raw talent from there just like illustration. It's a, it's a raw talent that you have to really hone that I've never actually been good at at all. Why do you think so many people do that? Like they'll find someone who's better than them and they'll try to tear them down and, oh, and try to jealousy. compete with them. Do you think it's just jealousy? Yeah, it's totally jealousy. Yeah. And we live in a world where we're told that we have to compete. We live in a world where um, the concept is to climb over everybody to get to the top. And it's not rewarding when you do that in my opinion. Um, I don't like having that kind of negativity and I don't like looking at somebody as an enemy. I'd rather say, oh, I can learn something from you and maybe I can bring something to the table that you're not as good at and we can benefit each other. So next, talk about some things you do for fun or some hobbies that you enjoy. So it sounds boring, but one of my favorite things to do ever is to walk. <laughs> I just love it. Um, I do a lot of traveling um, for work and for family. 
And whenever I'm anywhere, my preference is to explore that city on foot. Um, I try to average four miles a day um, because of today's rain and the unpredictability of it. I could not walk down here from Fremont, but that was the goal. Um, but I, I absolutely love going on a nice long walk and spending a few hours a day out and about exploring on foot. Um, otherwise, it's really just about, you know, going out with friends um, just to have a night out visiting and, and hanging out um, and then board games. I love board games like crazy. So, you know, like I'll, I'll sit down for a nice game of settlers once a week, if I could, if I could get enough people who want to play settlers with me once a week. <laughs> so how long have you been in the Fremont neighborhood? Uh, 16 years. Okay. Um, we bought in 2008 um, with, well, I guess so 15 and a half years. Uh, but we bought with this whole idea of um, this is our starter house and we will eventually move beyond the 900 square foot townhome that we purchased. Um, but then the housing market became what it became. And we kind of hit a point where we, during COVID said, oh, we can do this. We, we can handle this tiny spot. And I guess y'all don't have any kids. No. And that's, yeah. you know, you said I have a square feet. Yeah. Oh, I'm like, no kids. <laughs> yeah. No kids, no kids. And the amount of traveling that we always have to do, we also kind of hit this point of realizing why get a bigger house? What's the point if we're usually only in Seattle three weeks at a time before we're off to our next thing for another three weeks and then back for three or something like that. So if we were living in our place for months on end, we might feel that we need something bigger. But as it stands, we bought super low in 2008 and are super proud of the price we bought for. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who are from Seattle, explain the uh, unique personality of the Fremont neighborhood. I love Fremont. Um, everybody calls Fremont the center of the universe. Um, and I didn't really understand it when we moved to Fremont because Fremont wasn't even on our list. We were looking at um, primarily Capitol Hill, Central District, those areas, because that's where we had been living for most of our time in Seattle. Um, Fremont to us, we originally thought was Frat Central. And, you know, in 2004, that's where UW folks would go and, and party at night. And it was usually frat parties in different bars. And sorry if you're from a frat. Um, some of my best friends are, just so you know. Um, but at the time, we didn't feel like it was a, a place that would be quiet enough at night and feel like a neighborhood enough for us. Um, but one day we just went there uh, after finding a really cool townhome there. We decided let's spend a day here and realized it's a beautiful neighborhood. Um, and the personality of the neighborhood, what's great about it is that it's a bunch of college kids and a bunch of parents and their families and their kids and a bunch of entrepreneurs. It's this really interesting mix of people. It's a very eclectic part of Seattle. Um, and it's a very intentionally built neighborhood as well. Um, the, our, our old landlord um, is one of the Burks from the Burke Gilman Trail. We used to have a um, an office in Fremont for killer. And, um, Michael Burke was telling me just all about how intentionally they built Fremont, how much they took all the land in Fremont that they owned and started making sure that if they were selling it, it was to a business or a, a, a place that would elevate Fremont. And so I think that out of all the neighborhoods in Seattle, it is super quirky, super fun, and so intentional that you can just go anywhere and do anything you want, all within the confines of Fremont, and have a blast. That's the word quirky. I think actually for my reason. One thing that's my bucket list to do is like Seattle has all these great neighborhoods, right? Pernod Square, Capitol yep. Hill. I, I've been mean like 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 take a two week off, like one day spend at Capitol Hill, one day Ballard. It's all these unique things you know to do. Yes, exactly. That's actually just a, a few weeks ago we had done this whole day in Fremont unintentionally where. We were, you know, started out with brunch and then continued to just move around the neighborhood until suddenly we were home at 10 o'clock at night. And we looked at each other and just said, and we being my wife and I uh, just looked at each other and said, this is the absolute best neighborhood to live in. And yes, we could get a bigger house, but the first law of real estate is location, location, location. And so for living in Fremont, we just can't see any better place to live. So I have to ask this. You don't have to answer it. I don't want to. 
you take part in the annual naked bike ride, naked bike ride in Fremont? We, uh, one of our friends does. Um, so we go and cheer our friend on. <laughs> um, and what's funny is uh, she flies in from Michigan. So she used to live here and moved back home to Michigan and she'll come here almost every year for solstice. Hey, and they're actually 100% naked. Like they have body paint on. Or she some she kind does of body paint. She okay. does body paint for sure. Um, and definitely um, we've gone almost every year though. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's always a fun event, solstice. Let's go solstice. Yeah. So back to traveling, do you have a favorite place you've been to? Um, honestly, and it might sound kind of trite because I feel like almost anybody who's gone here says the same thing, but I've been to Amsterdam five times now. Um, Amsterdam is such a great city. I love Amsterdam. I really thought when, you know, it was my brother who told me to go to Amsterdam. It was my first time ever going to Europe. And I was getting tips from him of where to go because he is also a traveling salesman. You know, my dad raised him. So he he basically grew up to be just as um, entrepreneurial as my dad. And um, he's traveled all over the world for his stuff. And so my brother convinced me to go to Amsterdam and I thought, what a waste, because what Amsterdam is known for are two things that don't necessarily matter to me. Legal pot. Well, that exists here. So that was like, I'm not going to go travel to a different place in Europe just for that. And the red light district, which I do not care about at all um, or care for. Um, And so for me, I was like, why do I want to go to this place? And then I got there and fell in love. I, I describe it to people as Seattle and New York City got together and had a baby. And that is that's Amsterdam. A, that's a good explanation. Yeah. yeah. It's really fun. I love getting lost in Amsterdam. Because I went to like a few times when I was single, mm-hmm. two times when I married kids. Of course, mm-hmm. two different experiences, right? We're yeah. great, right? Because like right? when you're single, you do all the, you know, all the stuff you know, the wall yep. stuff you know. And you like when you're married kids, you go to the Amtrak Museum. Yep. The, I think it's called the Rex Museum, all the different stuff you know. It's just a fabulous place. It really is. It really is. And that's our thing. Like we we actually typically will end any um trip if we're out in Europe for I I had to travel to Europe for work all the time for um many, many years. And so we'd always end the trip in Amsterdam because it was a really nice way to kind of ease back in to America in yeah. a way. Um and it's also a really fun flight. To Seattle from Amsterdam. It's a really easy flight. So that was any any these on your bucket list you haven't been to yet? Yeah. Um, I really want to go to Copenhagen. Okay. That's definitely on my bucket list. Um, I definitely want to go to um gosh, now I'm getting the name of it. Um I just forgot the name of it. (laughs) So what's Singapore? Singapore. Okay. Okay. What's a place you've been to that you really like? And most people like you like that place? Like, how do you like that place? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Let me think of the best answer there because I'm wondering if it's in the States or out of the States. I guess, I guess people are surprised about how much I like going to the UK because it's not like it's anything fancy. Um, yeah, you got fancy accents, um, but in the end, it's it's just the same as being in America in a sense. So when people say, why'd you fly 10 hours to go to England? Um, It surprises a lot of people. But the thing is, is castles, they're, they're utterly amazing and they're everywhere in in England. So you can just go see things that are so much older than you and so much older than anything you'll find in this country. Um, So I absolutely love going around England and Wales. Um, I've only been to Ireland once, but hope to get there again. So just the UK in general, I think, a lot of people think it's, uh, eh, <laughs> yeah. you know. So I know when I was in the army, when I was single, when I first used to go to go with my friend, go to different countries, traveling and stuff. Within within seconds, you tell who the British people, right? Oh yeah, they're wild and crazy, talk uh-huh. aloud, drunk as fuck. You know, yeah, you're you're from Britain, yeah. Like there's, <laughs> like, there's no hiding, right? It, it is amazing. Um, we we walk around the streets the first time we ever went to London, and you know it'd be eleven o'clock, and you'd see about a hundred people standing outside of a bar drinking a pint, and then a couple hours, you know. It would all get empty. A couple hours later, there'd be another couple hundred people outside of a bar drinking a pint. And it's just this constant thing throughout the day, throughout any work day, what have you. People are stepping out and having a few pints and then going back to work and then having a few more. Um, but I will say, maybe it's just in the water. You don't get drunk as easily. I, I mean, you could just keep pounding those pints and be fine. <laughs> I remember being in Germany, like 19 years old, just drinking all day, drink, drinking during beer, coming to the States, like, 
it's just water. Man. Yeah, right. It's, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was, uh, when I was in Germany the first time. I was by Würzburg. We used to go to Frankfurt like once a week. It's an area called Sachsenhausen. Mm-hmm. They used to, like think of like Sixth Street in downtown Frankfurt. And the Irish pub, right, had a, a drink called uh, Puss and Boots, right? It was like a shot, a shot like this, and it was light on fire. If you could drink that, everyone drank for free the whole night. Oh, gosh. No one could ever do it. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was like basically like, like if it was right here, you could smell it from right here. It's like, it was like diesel. No one could do it, right? <laughs> yeah, there's no way I'd be able to do that at all. There's a, a bar in Amsterdam uh, that every single time we've gone in there, and it's not like we're remembered. This just must be what the bartenders do. Every time we've gone in there, out of the blue, they start just handing us shots. And it's always just, here's a free shot, here's a free shot. But it's always a super unique shot. And it's always like three or four shots. And they'll just do it. It We've probably been to that bar four or five times. Yeah. And it's just like clockwork that it happens. Um, but every time we've been there, there's always only been about 10 people in the bar. Yeah. So I don't know if we're just there at a light time of day or what. But it's, yeah generosity and shots or any type of shots that's the only time i do i've ever had shots is when they're forced on me by a bartender <laughs> so here's a funny story for you so one of the first times me and my two friends from germany went to amsterdam to visit right mm-hmm. we're doing the party or whatever and so next day i can't remember what time it was it was night or evening or whatever we go, we go to mcdonald's right yeah that's what more american thing to do go to mcdonald's right so we're sitting down and the booth across from us these two young amsterdam females right mm-hmm. like 19 20 years old right my uh, friend fucked me, what, what's that on the table? Like a bunch of white powder. Like, is that cocaine? What the fuck are they doing, right? And then I swear to God, this cop walks up. I'm like, oh, stick, we got busted, right? Because we knew marijuana is legal. Uh-huh. We, yeah. we didn't know about no other drugs. Exactly. And the cop asked him, can I ask you where you got this from? Oh, we know the person. We get it from all the time. Oh, just make it sure because there's been like some unsafe cocaine out there. We just want to make sure, right? We're like, what the fuck? Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We're like, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget. We're like, what in the war is going on, right? Right. It was like insane. That's laid back, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you said your, your hobby was walking and what else? I love walking. I love board games. Board games. Um, yeah, definitely. Oh, and, you know, just I love wine. Wine. That's another okay. big one, if we can call that a hobby. Just, instead I, I of, instead hobby. of alcoholism, we'll call it a hobby. That's a hobby. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. So any favorite wine out there, like Italian or French or something from the United States? So this year I um, have really gotten into pet gnats, okay. um, which I never knew existed before. But now, you, you know, once you hear a term, suddenly you hear it everywhere. Um, and really they're organic, natural um, wines. I, I like a good rosé. That's an organic rosé. because Typically it's got lower sulfites, lower alcohol content. So You can kind of just enjoy it without getting sloshed. And that's my issue is my tolerance at my age has gone way down. So where I used to be able to go wine tasting at like three or four wineries, I'll do one winery tops and then I'm done. Um, And so a pet nap I found, I can have a few glasses and just enjoy the wine and not feel like I'm hosty or anything like that, you know? Um, And and I like that because I'd rather just enjoy the wine. I remember starting out, you know, I could only drink like the Moscato dessert wine. Right. No, I can't even stand that, right? Right, exactly. Like, I can't even stand it. Like, I'm going to big Merlot guy now. Like, yeah, we were in, I love a good Merlot. We were in Italy. We were like 10 minutes from the, from the Vo Vine, Vo Vine uh, thing, which goes all the time. Mm-hmm. And from Italy, I figured a way to hack the system. I was able to ship 300 bottles of wine from Italy, and the government paid for 75% of it. What? Yeah. That's you know, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Italy has some great wine. Um, yeah, Italy has great wine. I, I love a good Lambrusco. Oh yeah, that's good and too. that's actually it, it was I we went to Italy um, on vacation, our first vacation uh, without working in 15 years. Um, we did that this past May, and leading up to it, I was so excited for it that I just started drinking a bunch of Lambrusco, um, and that's actually what made me then transition to Pet Nat. <laughs> so definitely, Italian wine is very very good wine. So here's another wine alcoholic story, right? Yep. So me and my friends, we were stationed in Germany. We used to go to this Italian restaurant like 20 minutes away from the base, right? And every night we'll get these, like these, um, the brusco, right? Those small glass of brusco. It was so good, right? We'd drink it, drink it, whatever. We'd go on, on there for a while. And finally, the waiter said, hey, um, you know, instead of paying like, it was eight marks of a wine, of glass, you can buy the whole bottle for eight marks. Oh, shit, okay. He bought this, the biggest bottle ever, right? But there's one catch. You have to drink it all here. Oh, gosh, of and, course. Of course, being dumb as we are, we drink it all there, right? Yep. And the, and the, and the, Ride home was like, I mean, we can do it today, right? Was like, like my friend Alan, he was, the, he was in the back seat, hitting kill, kept side of the head. 
So you see, you don't stop much, stop this car and, and put you in the trunk. You hit them again. They ran this different neighborhood, run over Mercedes Benzes and BMWs. The alarm's gone off. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's not good. <laughs> no. <laughs> and finally, Kyoki catch and put in the trunk. We we go to the gate, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, me, me and Cookie Buffett got Alan's in the trunk, right? He fell asleep. And it's weird, a bang. And I guard like, what's, what's that? What's that, right? Because back then, soldier, like, sneak girl, German girls in the, the trunk of the car to go on base, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, crazy times. <laughs> Those were the days. No. Yeah. And do that nowadays. <laughs> nope. So, next, talk about this thing. Um, you were top, you were the 50 top content marketers from Content Marketing World 2023. Yeah. I guess that's a pretty big deal. To me, it is. Yeah. Um, I was very honored for that. Um, I, I love content marketing world. It's my now, favorite. Did someone conference. like nominate you for that or just like pick you out a crowd or how did how, how the nomination process work? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. One day, um, suddenly it was posted and I thought, oh, cool. This is great. Because um, the Content Marketing Institute that puts on content marketing world um, is, in my opinion, one of the best thought leaders out there when it comes to marketing and content marketing. Um, I follow all of their publications on a regular basis. Um, I, you know, go out of my way every year to um, do whatever I can to speak at Content Marketing World because I think it is the best marketing conference um, that exists in the country um, and one of the most accessible marketing conferences out there. Um, and so, yeah, ultimately, um, I a couple of weeks before Content Marketing World, um, they put out that list and. I was pretty thrilled that that made that humbled me a lot. That made me feel very good. So what's the benefit of being named is like you get a some kind of monetary award is just the you know the the knowledge that you're in this list of people. I think it's just the knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. Um I've really worked hard to share everything I learn when I learn it because I, I think that I, I think that the most powerful tool you can ever give anybody is knowledge. And I'm very eager to learn new tips and tricks when it comes to marketing. I'm really digging into AI right now and learning everything I can about AI. Um, and then my, like, what really just brings me joy is once I learn something, sharing it with anybody and everybody who's willing to listen. Um, and so if in doing that, that leads to me getting on a list like that, I feel like, cool, all I was doing was what I like to do. I like, I like when people listen to me talk. <laughs> so what is your definition of content marketing? Um, it's to me, so there's the definition and then there's what is proper content marketing. The, the general definition is um, putting out content to connect with your audience and engage them on your brand. Um, now, one person said to me once, um, every piece of content that you deliver is a door that people can open to walk into your brand. And I really like that idea of content marketing, that it's creating these inviting doorways. So when you look at it as a doorway, then you start to think, okay, well, I have to make sure that this is something that people understand as opposed to being over their head, because if it's over their head, that's a, you know, a steel door that is locked shut. Um, so it has to be a nice, light, easy to open door, screen door, preferably. Um, so you have to make sure that you're giving people content that empowers them and makes it easy for them to open that door. In other words, um, a lot of people see content marketing as just putting out content for content's sake. And the fact is, is audiences can understand when they're just being handed cheap content that is rushed just to try and like attempt to get their attention. You have to really earn somebody's attention. And the way you earn somebody's attention is you give them something that they can use to empower their own day or their own career. And great content marketing is always focused on empowering the audience and through that empowerment, earning their trust. And content can be blogs, video, it covers everything, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that was really what my company focused on. Um, we started out with infographics which is why we were called Killer Infographics, because um, in 2010, um, infographics were really all the rage and a really exciting way to get people's attention. Um, then we started doing motion graphics um, about a year in. Then we started doing interactive content, then eBooks, then um, animated GIFs and online ads. And we just kind of kept building, building, and building 
until we were creating a whole content, um, you know, content ecosystem for our clients. And so we really started focusing on content strategy for our clients, but specifically visual strategy, um, hence the name killer visual strategies. It, the idea being audiences demand visual content first and foremost, 91% of people will look for a video um, first. And if they can't find a video, they're going to look for another picture-based form of content before they're willing to do any reading at all. So you have to hook people with visual content, but we all have very discerning tastes, which means you have to hook people with high quality visual content to really get their attention. Um, a great example is the production value of this podcast, the three camera setup and jumping around between cameras, having great sound, having great lighting. There's, it makes it sound so good when you say it. It is. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's really good intent and good production value um, that takes it up a notch and makes it a lot more intriguing than your average podcast. And that's, it's a, it's great content marketing. So let's presume someone's putting out good content. Is there such a thing as putting out too much good content? I don't think there's such a thing as putting out too much good content. Um, unless you start to sacrifice quality for quantity. Um, it's, and unfortunately there's a lot of companies out there tightening the purse strings and starting to really sacrifice quality for quantity, leaning too heavily on AI to produce content without realizing how to get rid of the AI aesthetic. Um, for instance, is a great example, using chat GPT to write blog posts <laughs> without like jumping in and massaging that text. Um, people are getting angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So next. So I'm from Texas mm -hmm. and I love Whataburger. Oh yeah. And I saw where y'all did a, where you jump started the New Year for Whataburger with some kind of digital campaign. Can you talk about the whole process of how that came about and what that's about? So I actually can't really speak to that. So um, Material, my parent company did that. And by the time they jumped in and did that, I was already in my senior fellow role. Okay. And my senior fellow role isn't really involved in the day to day. Um, the best person to speak to that would actually be some of the amazing creative directors at Material. Um, the, the campaigns that material is putting out there are mind blowing. Um, I'm so proud to be associated to their brand. I think that they, they just do really compelling work. Can you talk some about your agency that you had killer visual strategies, how that came about? Yeah, definitely. Uh, killer started in, um, 2010 as a pivot. We had, um, my then business partner and I had a completely different business model. Our business model was lead generation. We were doing affiliate marketing. We had a bunch of different websites um, where we were either selling leads to um, larger companies, like um, one was a, a set of senior care um, websites that were selling leads to a senior care um, company here in Seattle. Um, another one was a, a site called Zippy Cart that compared and contrasted e-commerce software, and it was used affiliate marketing to earn money. Um, and then I started designing infographics for those sites for the marketing value. And the first infographics I designed were utterly awful. They were not infographics. They break every single rule of infographic design that I have shared with people over the years. Um, they're just awful. Um, and luckily I had enough people tell me that they were awful um, that I really trusted in the industry. So I started learning how to improve them. And then about three or four months into it, a content marketing agency that is now defunct, um, but existed at the time needed infographic designers. And they reached out and asked if we could start designing infographics for them. Our original business model was not really growing in any way, shape or form and was barely generating enough revenue to keep us afloat. So I looked at the opportunity to um, start turning around infographics for more money and kind of convinced my business partner that we should do it. Um, even though he knew it was going to be a very huge, um, endeavor to take on that would take us much further from our original business model. Um, but we agreed to do it. We agreed to kind of see where it took us. And after six months, it became clear that that was where our focus needed to be. So we got rid of all the other websites. We sold them off and, focused entirely on killer. And then um, 
as we grew the company, as we brought in amazingly talented creative individuals um, who had their own vision for what we could become, we all as a team started putting together new product offerings for our clients and honing our process and really building out an agency we could all be really proud of. Um, but because the company started as an accident, I'd say it took me a few years, if not five years, to really get intentional about it. And so I was lucky enough to have a team of amazing employees that saw what was possible before I did and kind of helped nudge me in the right direction. And then um, we were able to build something really beautiful together. Um, and then in 2018, knowing that the company was kind of hitting this really good level of um, a lot of great clients. I mean, primarily Fortune 500 clients, um, a lot of amazing projects, but not being able to bring our clients everything that was necessary to give them an end-to-end -end experience. We were, we were doing the content piece, but we, what we weren't doing was taking the content to market for them. What we weren't doing is focus groups to make sure that we were pulling together the best insights and research to inform our strategies. Those were the things that were missing um, from our skill set. And so we started looking for a partner. And that is where we um, found the lovely um, family of agencies in an agency roll up that has now become material. And how are you able to convince these Fortune 500 companies to come on with y'all, like Microsoft, Boeing? What was the process for that? Microsoft was the first. Um, and I really am thankful to Microsoft because the um, clients we had at Microsoft knew that at the time we were a very fledgling company. Um, I think, you know, we had fully embraced the pivot in 2012. Do you have a connection with Microsoft already? Or was this like no. a big cold calling, so to speak? It was um, my, my business partner at the time. He had been cold calling for a good six or seven months before somebody got back to us. Um, so he really worked hard to close that deal. Um, and basically what happened was um, a couple of years in, we were in our first real full year of being committed to the agency. We landed um, a Microsoft vendor status. And the client who helped us land that status really did some good handholding for us. Um, we took on a project that we should have charged three times what we charged for, um, but we didn't know that at the time. We didn't realize how much work it would be. Um, and she was so patient with us, um, taught us how to treat an enterprise client. And then from there, we knew how to do things differently. And our work with Microsoft um, then extended into work with Starbucks and then Expedia um, and then Amazon. And um, I started speaking at conferences um, in 2013. 2014, I did about 30 conferences 2015, about 50 conferences, like it just kept going up. So being at those conferences, we were getting in front of enterprise clients. And then we had this nice portfolio of work that we had done with these clients, local clients who were giving a local startup a shot. Um, and so I, I do credit a lot of our success to being in Seattle and having the, um, the, it's not, like we've got a startup environment that's amazing here. We have an entrepreneurial environment that's amazing here, but we also have this corporate environment that gives back to the community in so many ways that I just feel like we're starting in the right place at the right time. Um, and had we not been a Seattle company, I don't know if those companies would have given us the chances that they did, but they did. And they taught us to be better through the process. And we kept getting better and better until we kept landing larger and larger projects. And suddenly, instead of having 300 small clients, we had, you know, 30 gigantic clients. So how many people do you have working for you? Um, killer, we had 30 people before we sold and became part of Material. And now Material has about 2,000 people around the globe. And at your company, I guess it was all bootstrapped. You didn't do any fundraising like that was all bootstrapped, right? Totally bootstrapped. Um, we didn't take any money from anyone. Um, we started with an investment of $750 between my old business partner and I to um, buy Zippy Cart. Um, so that, our, that was part of the original business model that was bu us buying that domain. 
Um, we worked out of my, uh, my old partner's townhome for the first year before we could afford our own office. Um, every six months almost, we moved offices. Luckily, we had the same landlord for a bit um, and kept growing out of our offices. But it was all bootstrapped. Um, I didn't take a salary. My business partner didn't take a salary for the first two years. Um, we made sure that we saved a bunch of money ourselves before starting the company and um, made sure that our team got paid first. And as we grew, our team's salaries grew. And um, it took a while, actually, probably about five years before I feel like our salaries were really competitive. We had a lot of people knowing they were getting a startup salary um, and signing on to the growth. And we made sure that we found ways to um, give them great benefits and give them great pay as we grew. What's your advice to someone out there like Ruth right now? In the mind, man, I, I need to go fundraise. I need to get VC money. Right? No. What's your advice? Then? Like they're like they're kind of struggling in their mind. If I get this million dollars, it'll you know put fuel on the fire. I'll grow the company fast. What's your advice to them? I think that when you're playing with other people's money, you're never going to work that hard. You might think you are, but in the end, when you're playing with your own money and your own livelihood, that's when your blood, sweat, and tears goes into it. That's when you're working 80 hours a week and making sure things are actually brought up off the ground. After you've proven yourself in the market and you want to go catapult to the next level, that's when you go get an investor. And that was our thing. Um, you know, when we went to sell Killer, the original idea was let's get an investor. And we found an opportunity that took the company even further. Um, but the whole idea was we've proven ourselves in the market. We're ready to catapult. How are we going to catapult now? Um, but I think that if you start with an investor from the beginning, um, first of all, you're not, these days, you're not going to find somebody who's going to just invest in you. That's not how it's it so works. Hard to say. Yeah. People it, don't realize like, it's so hard. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, Theranos ruined it for everyone. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> for, uh, that, who's that dude who's on trial right now? Sam. Sam Bankman Fried. Yeah. S SBF, is that his name? Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. The guy from WeWork. Well, yep. I actually got a million dollars, a hundred million dollars or something else. So. I know, which is ridiculous. But yeah, I feel like when you're playing with other people's money, it, you take a lot more risks and you separate yourself from the grind so much faster. Um, You'll get the fancy office, you know, the exactly. salary. And I think the stats out there that like, even, even you get funding, only 1% of VC funded companies make it right. Right. No, I, no, I think it's 1% of companies raise money and out of that 1% only don't even make it. Something like that, you know, it's very low. Exactly. And the other thing to consider is it's no longer your vision. The minute you have somebody paying for it is the minute you are wholly accountable. Even if they said we're hands off. Yes. Yeah, no, they, not. they will never be hands off. Yeah. And it's, it's not like you can sleep easy at night knowing that you have all these people who are expecting a lot of output from you because of the amount of input they put in. Um, it's, I, I feel like at least for me, um, owning a business meant I was fully accountable to my employees and their families. And being accountable beyond that is something that I, I wasn't entirely prepared for when I went and sold the company. I didn't realize, oh, wait, now I'm also accountable to all the people who just invested in me and the growth. I mean, luckily, I, I sold it to an amazing group with phenomenal leaders who gave me a lot of freedom and I think taught me more in um, the three years I was doing the day to day there taught me more in that three years than I learned running my own company. Um, I, I learned from some utterly phenomenal leaders in the agency space. When someone says they're a marketer, what, what comes to your mind? Do you think they're a marketer that does everything? They're just focused on one thing. Cause marketing is a pretty broad, broad scope of things, right? It is a broad scope. And usually I'll just ask what kind of marketer. Um, so what do you do when someone says I'm a marketing expert? I'm pretty sure you like your eyes on the back of the head, don't you? Don't they? They they really do because especially with like, AI, you echo to everything. Yeah, that's the thing. Especially with AI today, there is no way you can keep up and be a marketing expert. It's like saying I play the entire orchestra. Mm -hmm. I play every instrument. No, you if you play every instrument in the orchestra, you're okay at every instrument, but there's no way you're giving enough hours to be an expert. I at mean, every unless instrument. your name is Prince or someone like that, right? And even Prince couldn't play every instrument no. in the orchestra. No. So yeah, it's, it's, it's too randomizing at this point. Um, the other thing I've heard from a lot of people is I'm a marketer. Um, 
because they have these gut feelings <laughs> and they're like, I know in my gut, this will look good on social. And you, like no data, no AB testing. That's literally what I was about to say. Yeah. You bring up analytics and right over their head, they, they're suddenly surprised. They have never heard of analytics before. They don't even understand it, but you are not a marketer unless you live in data. Yeah. That's how I feel. HR the same way. People HR says, I don't do numbers. I'm HR. HR is nothing but numbers. And right. It's like, what are you, are you kidding me right now? Exactly. They just say, it's, it's a gut feeling. I just, one of the things because my HR people, when they say, oh, you need fair data, I'm a hiring expert. Are you really? Like every hire you made is a hundred percent home run. Mm -hmm. I doubt that very much. Exactly. Exactly. So I know a lot of like, there's a lot of market, like markers out there. They run like agencies, SEO agencies, what do you want to call it? And it's like, I always tell like a, a startup founder, give us six months, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, you can pay the money, give six months and nothing happens, right? Yep. So how does a startup founder or a small business owner in general say, hey, how do they decide it's worth me taking risk of paying this agency or this marketing person for six months with no results? But that's a big risk. Like if you're a startup, you pay someone six months of money. I'm assuming like $2,000 a month. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. That's like 12,000 gone, right? With no results. So how do you protect yourself against that? That's a great question. Um, the fact is, is there are so many agencies that are fly by night agencies. So many out there. I so mean, many. Even Seattle, right? Just, yes. just, just ridiculous. And what drives me nuts are the people who say, oh, I have a whole agency when it's one person who's getting jobs on Fiverr. Oh, yeah. Or oh, that on Fiverr, I'll start the Philippines. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so what I always say, and this is what I said running killer as well, is you have to first talk to a bunch of different agencies. Never pick the first one you talk to. You might pick them in the end, but don't, you have to at least talk to five agencies before you hire one. You have to see on that agency website, a full portfolio of work. You have to see customer testimonials and be able to reach out to a customer or two and get their feedback. Make sure that if it's a customer testimonial, it needs to be attached to their full name. Not like Tom said this or something like that. Um, I saw one agency site the other day where I looked at the testimonials and could quickly see that, oh, well, every testimonial is actually an old coworker of yours, not a client of yours. Or if you like search the name on LinkedIn or social media, nothing comes up. Exactly. No, no, where to be found. Exactly. And then the other big thing that I wholeheartedly believe in is you have to see their team. Um, what always has driven me nuts, and this this is what I think was really hard. Um, or pardon me, not hard. It was we realized eventually it wasn't hard. It was our uh, key differentiator as killer was our entire team was in house under one roof before COVID. Um, we were all in house under one roof. And that made the difference for our clients. Our clients knew that they could call our office and talk to any one of us at any point in time. They knew that if they needed us to come into their office, that the people they saw on our website were the people who would show up at the office. They knew that we weren't outsourcing all of the work to freelancers because the minute you remove yourself um, in, in that way and you have freelancers who are independent contractors doing the work, um, not that it's bad to like grow and, and, and shrink with independent contractors. There's ways to do that right. But if that is your only source of talent, you eventually hit a point where how are you going to hold those people accountable to you enough for your client to hold you accountable to them? Um, you're just the middleman at that point. And so I say to anybody who's looking for an agency, find out where their talent comes from. Make sure that that talent is W2'd and accountable or that a portion of that talent is w 2 even if they have to pull in some 1099s, that's fine, as long as at least the project manager is w 2 for instance. So make sure that there are employees under some form of a contract working directly with and in the company. Um, make sure that that company has a history of doing the work you're looking for and look at portfolios as well as talk to past clients to make sure that the results they promise actually will happen. And how long should you stay with an agency before you get rid of them, so to speak, if you're not happy with them? Should you give them the six months or should it take a couple months or just it, or is it a gut feel, so to speak? It completely depends on what you're looking for them to do for you. That's the issue. Marketing is so broad that, you know, you might be saying, hey, I'm hiring an agency to grow my customer base. Well, in that case, we have to say, are you, brand, are you in a brand new industry that has never existed before? Are you disrupting a market? Do you have very large competitors and you're a tiny guy in this market? 
we have to really define what, what are the actual metrics that we're going to gauge success by. And we have to make that definition right up front together and make sure we're on the same page. Once we know what your final goals are, then we can sit down and say, well, here's how many months this is going to take. Because sometimes it can happen in three weeks to a month if you're looking for something very, very specific and small. Other big marketing campaigns might take six months to a year to start really driving results. And so that's the other thing about your agency partner. They have to be able to sit down with you and agree on that set of metrics and properly set expectations and then lay out a full schedule for you, showing exactly what their process is to achieve those goals. Because then if they're not following along with that process or that schedule in a few months, then get rid of them. Because clearly, if the only way to achieve those goals is to follow that schedule and process, and you're following your end of the deal, you're following your part of the schedule and process, you're not holding things up for them, then if they're not following on their end, they're not going to achieve the goals they're promising. But if they're following a, a clear process that you've both agreed on and you're not holding up the schedule, because that's a big thing, clients often can hold up the schedule and then get mad that they're not seeing results. Um, so as long as you're not holding up the schedule as well and you're hitting all of your deadlines, then you should see the results and you should stay committed for the duration of the contract. So back to contractors and W-2s, like I don't think a lot of people realize that when you, you hire a contractor, of course you save, like you don't have to pay tax, whatever, but are they really investing in your company, right? Exactly. So you're, you hire a contractor, they've hired like four or five different clients they're working for. We have an employer, it's going to cost you more, mm -hmm. you know, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. But odds are they're going to be way more committed to you than way more. the freelancer yeah, or the contractor. Yeah, I think some people don't get that. I think they're short-sighted, so to speak. Exactly. I can see there's, there's a way to do it right. But the only way you can do it right is if you have really strong project managers and creative directors, if you're a creative agency, at least, if you have really strong project managers and creative directors in-house, then it becomes a little bit easier for um, hiring freelancers because they, their full-time job is to make sure that those freelancers are accountable and they build relationships with those freelancers and can have very, you know, long-term, years-long commitments and relationships with those freelancers. So there are arenas where it works out really, really well. Um, whenever we had to grow and scale up and we would have to bring in a freelancer, our first thing would be to tell a client, hey, we have to bring in a freelancer for this. Our second thing would be to look for freelancers whose full-time job is freelance. Because if it's not their full-time job, then they're not beholden to us. They're beholden to the, to the nine to five that's paying their bills and giving them their benefits. Like they might not turn things in on time at that point. Um, and what's interesting is there are a lot of small agencies, two or three people out there, those types of agencies. I find those to be the best to hire because they work like a freelancer in the sense that um, your financial commitment can ebb and flow with them, but they're committed to you like you are to your client because you are their client. And so that's also a really great way to, to scale with needs of the business. All right. You ready for a drink? Yeah, let's do Anyone it. Anyone you want to try or? What's your smoothest? What's your favorite? I'm, I, uh, I love. This one probably the smoothest. Okay, let's go with that. I was just in Kentucky uh, a couple weeks ago. Let me pour you one. Oh, thank you. Mine nice. Nice and neat and small. Cheers. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, Nick's. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, something called Frank August. I like it. Yeah. Next, talk about what you do as a senior fellow of visual strategy for material. So this is actually the type of role I kind of always wanted. Um, I love public speaking. I love, like I said earlier, I love sharing everything I've learned. Um, I do a lot of LinkedIn learning content, for instance, where I'll put together whole courses on singular subjects. Um, and so we kind of hit a point about two years in where we had all just gone through COVID together. Um, the company did a really amazing job of evolving through COVID. I think that we had all had this vision of becoming one company over a five-year period. 
And that was uh, February of 2020 when that vision hit and then COVID hit. And suddenly we were one company overnight. Um, and everybody was working together as such an amazing team all across the country at the time before we um, grew into a global agency with um, offices around the globe. Um, and so it was about two years after COVID and I said, how can we kind of rework my position so that I can focus on public speaking? Um, I never want to start an agency again, so I'm not going to walk away and, and start, start anything com competing. What I want to do is what I've found to be my favorite part of running an agency, which is teach people. And if I can teach people on behalf of material, um, I would love to do that. And so that's kind of the idea of the senior fellowship role. Um, it started with me um, going back on my um, beat writing ink articles because I um, have been an ink contributor for many, many years. Um, so first I started going back and doing one ink article a week. Um, then I started focusing on going back to speaking because we were all going back into conferences finally. Um, and then putting out um, a course on customer experience design on LinkedIn learning. This year I've done three courses for LinkedIn learning. Um, the first course I turned in was on how to build your own visual content marketing strategy. The second course, um, which just launched about a month and a half ago was infographic design theory. So it builds off my infographic design course, but gives people an actual way to dissect every infographic and grade them to determine whether or not they're going to be a success. Um, and then the course that should be published in the next week, if it didn't already publish a, in the last couple of days, because I haven't looked, is um, advanced data visualization. So it's taking my data viz course I already have. And for anybody who's watched that course, taking them to the next level with far more advanced charts and graphs and data analytics. So when you come in as acquired uh, material, do they put you on the board of directors or something? Or do they say, here's the money, you know, do something else? How does that work? They did a great job of trusting every agency, um, agency founder that they brought on. They um, gave us all a voice. They gave us all an opportunity to um, grow onto the leadership team if we wanted to. Um, and they gave us all um, a stake in the game to really make sure that um, we were all really committed to the success of the company. And by that, I mean, letting us be a part of the, the future vision is huge. They knew that we were all entrepreneurs and they knew that the typical acquisition where you hang a, a golden carrot in front of somebody and just ask them to run to it doesn't work for entrepreneurs um, because entrepreneurs are, we're often incentivized by money if we know how to make it ourselves. Like if we're the ones in charge of every step for making it, but if somebody else gives us a roadmap for it, we run away because it's not our roadmap. Um, so they didn't do that. They, and that's awesome because that classic acquisition style, usually the entrepreneur runs away within a year, but yeah, instead they, they made sure everybody was heard. And there were um, a few agency owners who really kind of floated to the top of leadership because they had such immense experience and such immense skill. Um, so for me, the biggest value I was given, in my opinion, was the mentorship. Um, I just, some amazing people taught me so much over that time. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Do you miss not having your own company, so to speak? Yes and no. The, the fact is, is I miss the family. Um, my team are, I still consider them my team no matter what. Um, I was at the, the wedding of one of my employees um, in the summer and ran into a bunch of people I hadn't seen since COVID. Um, some who had left the company after acquisition, some who had stuck around. Um, and it was a great family reunion, so to speak. Um, so I think that's really the big thing I miss. We built this really big family of creatives and I loved coming in every day and we we're an open, open concept um, office. And so you could walk in and see all these huge computer monitors with beautiful artwork. Uh, we had a lot of offices because okay. we kept growing, but our final office, which of course we moved into in February of 2020. Of course. Perfect um, timing. Yeah. It was the perfect office, which makes me so sad because it was the office that I felt like we had really been growing to as a company. 
uh, it was in South Lake Union and our first office where we had the entire floor where, you know, an elevator opened up to our own lobby and all of that. Um, but we've always had offices that kind of feel like this room, but much bigger. Yeah. We have always had exposed brick. We've always had, um, we've avoided any type of cubicles and, um, we, we won GeekWire's geekiest office many years ago, which, um, the reward for that was actually a bunch of knoll desks. <laughs> uh, so we started having a bunch of standing desks in the office and that have completely changed the game for all of us. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, my favorite office I think we ever had was, um, the one that, that we were in for a month. <laughs> yes. I think our neighborhood, South Lake Union is another like, great neighborhood. It is. Yeah, no good neighborhood. So you, you said you had like 30 employees, right? So talk about this, right? Talk about what your process of getting rid of someone, right? Like someone's not working out. Talk about that process. I think a lot of people like, you know, in HR, they say hire slow, fire fast. Mm -hmm. No one fires fast, right? It's, no one I, does. I, I want to call it, I don't, don't want to fire Jason. It's his birthday or it's this or that. And before you know it, I'm working for you for three months. Yep. And everyone's looking upside of your head like, what the fuck is Jason still doing here? Exactly. And then you look bad. Yeah. So talk about that process. Exactly. I, I am definitely not one to peel the Band-Aid off fast. I'll tell you that. Um, I learned how to. I learned um, the hard way how to. Um, I do think that the when you when you lose an employee, whether they've quit or you've had to let them go, it's a huge learning experience every single time. Um, before we learned how to hire intentionally, um, we had only let one person go prior to that. And that was just a clear, that, that issue was like one or two years into the business and a clear violation of policy. So that was a quick rip the bandaid off for that one. But ultimately what we did was we said, we're hiring people based on the values of the company. And once we hired people based on the values of the company and we made sure they aligned with our values, then it became a lot easier to bring those values to the table when somebody would get their first warning, where we could sit down and say, here are our six core values. Here is how your action went against these two values. Now that you know that, what might you do differently? If they were underperforming, it might not be a values related thing, but instead if they're underperforming, we could put them on a PIP, a performance improvement plan. Um, and for the most part, that would help get people either to where they needed to be or to a mutual decision that this, this isn't the right fit for you. Um, so we had a process behind it. And I think that having a process behind it really ensured that nobody felt like they were just that, that they had whiplash, that they were surprised by being let go. Um, there, you know, there, there've been times where unfortunately we had to make big changes, you know, during COVID um, a lot of people had to make big changes and that was probably not probably that was, the absolute hardest because, you know, that was when you're having to pare down your team um, when nobody deserves to be pared down. Um, so those are very emotional, very hard choices to make. Um, but prior to that, we really just tried to focus on logic and be as communicative as, as possible. And going through a PIP matters, but before you even get to that, it's hiring based on values. And when you hire based on values, I feel like 95 to 99% of problems can be solved right then and there without hurting anybody's feelings because the values that you all agreed on, um, it's kind of like our constitution. As long as we all agree to abide by this, then no ego gets in the way. It's instead a humbling experience for everybody involved. So what role do you think companies should play like in politics, right? Should a company say, we're pro this, anti mm -hmm. this, like, you know, if something happens, they say, should like, be like, I mean, things come to mind like a few years ago when all those people like was with the torches, Charlotte Bill, Virginia, the alt-right, and they got a lot of them got fired. Is that the role of, of, of a company or what do you, what's your take on that stuff? That's a great question. Um, I had the privilege of having a small company and because I had a small company, everybody had a say. And because we were so values driven, we were very aligned. Um, I remember walking into the office the day after the 2016 election and we all felt 
the exact same. And we were all very somber. And our solution as a team was to put good back out into the world. So what we did as a team was we came up with a campaign called Numbers to Unite. And we um, every week would put out an infographic showing data about all the things we agree on as a country or debunking fake news, debunking um, ideas that, um, I don't know, let's say one of them was about um, the value of immigration for America. So debunking the idea that we should um, never let anybody come into this country, for instance. Um, so we tried to coalesce around that. But in addition, we would, um, if we had a controversial client, we would sit down as a team and discuss whether we wanted to take the client on or not. And this is a big kind of question of controversy for all companies right now is um, whether or not you should be forced to do service for somebody that goes against your own moral beliefs. Um, and it's, it's a very big quandary for me as a gay woman, considering that's typically what's been brought up politically. Um, but at the same time, we turned down some companies that just really did not go with our own views. Um, I remember very happily writing to one company saying, sorry, I realize you're one of our first potential Fortune 500 clients, but I'm going to say no to you because um, you have campaigns out there that are, um, they, they were a big funder for the Proposition 8 campaign in California, which took away marriage from 18,000 legally married gay couples. Um, and so I was very happy to say no to that company because my marriage was one of those marriages. I got married in California legally before it was legal here. Um, so I do think that companies should have a right to decide whether or not their work propels forward something that is very ethically and morally wrong to them. Um, I don't believe that you should simply just deny business to people, um, I mean, based on who they are for profit business, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but I also do think that, you know, the, the question of, is it the company's job or not? I think was answered with, um, now I forget the, the name of the political decision, but the political decision back in the nineties that decided that a corporation was a person. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Corporations are free speech, yeah. Exactly. And so if we're going to say that, then a corporation has a right to come out in favor or against a political policy. Um, and they have a right to determine if their employees are living by the values of the company. Um, if you are going to be a company that hires and fires by your values. But you can't just willy-nilly nitpick how you how you employ your values you have to live them as a company to use them in a fireable offense how about if an employee comes to you and says hey you know what based on my morals and my mm -hmm. values i can't work for this company we have come on totally board. fine okay yeah that, do something that happened several times um we had a couple of different companies where we knew we were teetering the line where half the team said i do want to work for this company because um while yes, maybe there are um, aspects of the company that might be morally questionable, like maybe it's an oil and gas company, for instance, and, and maybe that was what was more morally questionable. Um, others wanted to take it on because they felt like the actual project was doing good and bringing good into the world. Um, and so we always had that conversation. And there were a few companies where we all just outright voted, no, we're not going to work for this company. Um, specifically cigarette companies. Yeah. We, even though we had smokers on our staff, um, we all agreed, no, we're not going to do any content for a cigarette company, yeah. for instance. Example, like talking about overcome, like post VP, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose someone came to you beforehand and said, let's work for VP, you'd probably say no, right? Mm -hmm. But then let's suppose after their big accident, what's it called? They're in the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, it was the... I can't think of the name of it. I can't think of the name of it either. Like, being into oil. Yeah. What if they came to you after I said, hey, you know, we messed up. We want to fix it. Here's all the things we're doing to fix it. All the steps were taken. Would you take on something like that afterwards? Yeah, especially if like, the, when you see that had a good, good intent, like we fucked this up. Yeah, we're a horrible company. We want to fix it. Here's what we're doing. Especially if the company was was the if the project was pushing that information. Um, a good example is you know Starbucks here. 
I love Starbucks. I'm a huge fan of Starbucks. Um, I love the consistency of the coffee and I go to Starbucks everywhere I possibly can. It's the, it's, it's the experience, right? Yes, I love it. Um, yet at the same time, I totally understand like my sister refuses to go to Starbucks um, because Starbucks um, uses paper cups um, that are wax lined in the middle. So you can't really recycle them. Um, and because of just that polluting factor, Starbucks came to us um, and showed us their green initiative, showed us all the ways that they are getting to um, net zero, um, showing, showed us all the campaigns they have to move to reusable cups, which I've been watching these campaigns happening in the store. It's, all, it's rolling out exactly the way they said it would. Um, and they asked us to be a part of the content for that. We jumped on it. We are already doing a bunch of other content for them because the values of their company, we really do agree with. Um, our, I, I'm saying it as if it's present tense, uh, but Killer as a company no longer exists. Um, so this was when I was running Killer. Um, Starbucks was one of our absolute favorite clients. All of us loved working for Starbucks, but they would be that example where not only did we get to do really cool work that was partner focused for Starbucks, that was focused towards all their employees, because that's what they call their employees or partners. And that was really cool work where we got to push the values of Starbucks and show how people could move up the Starbucks ladder and get great education and all of that. Yeah, like, don't, all the like what's it, all the partner all the baristas and stores at free college, you know. Yes. My my sister in law um, has been a barista there since high school, and she got um, full college paid for, graduated with a graphic design degree. Now she's doing graphic design work for them. I mean. It's pretty amazing what's possible within a company like theirs. So yes, there are certain controversial things that people might say they take issue with, but the fact is, is that's a company that hears that yeah. and then looks for solutions. And so that was a really good example of something where we got to be a part of the solution, which is really fun and so rewarding. Um, and we were already pretty sold on the company because it's, a great company. It's a great company. There are Starbucks, Starbucks, like they get, they get um, grief from the left and the right. Yeah, know? they do. So if you're getting grief from the left and the right, you might be doing something right, I think, you know. That's true. I agree with you on that. And then like um, one thing, like I don't, I'm not, I like, like unions, right? I, I can't understand. Maybe someone educate me, like, why are they unionizing Starbucks, right? I mean, like, I just, I don't get it, right? I've had that question. I, I, I don't get it, right? Like, it's a great, it seems like a great place to work. Yeah, of course, okay, maybe I don't remember 10 coffee orders, whatever, you know. I don't get it. And then, you know, it was on one of the social media where I guess they're trying to, they're trying to like a boycott Starbucks because I guess the union to me is separate from Starbucks. Mm -hmm. They're like a pro Hamas, pro Palestinian social media post, right? I got and it. So these people are like, we're going to, we're going to boycott Starbucks. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, what? There's like two, they have nothing to do with Starbucks, right? Exactly. I don't, I don't get it, right? There's nuances in everything. And I think that we have become too used to, um, reading the headline and not reading the story behind the headline and understanding those nuances. Um, and as a society, we have a lot of knee jerk reactions. It we're, we're, everything is what's the next hot button issue to divide us. And Starbucks is actually a perfect example of that. Um, and I do think you're right. I think that if you're, if you're pissing off the far, far left and the far, far right, you're probably doing something right. Because I do believe that at least 80% of us, live somewhere in the middle and just don't want to constantly be pulled in one direction or the other. Um, and I do think that there are plenty of companies that are a really good example of hearing from everybody and trying to make the right decisions. And it's interesting. I was just talking uh, the other day about the push for unionizing all around the country. And I'm very, very pro-union. At the same time, there are companies I see where I'm like, why? Do do you need a union? It seems like the company is doing everything in their I mean, power to give you benefits. I mean, if you're if you're a plumber making ten dollars a ten dollars a okay. day, yeah, you probably need a union. Or, exactly. You know, there are a lot of companies that if, need if it. If you're picking strawberries, you know, yep. you probably need a union. But like you're an accountant, you know, yes. or like yes, exactly. If you're a teacher, you need a union. You know, like there there are places that need unions, <laughs> but yeah, there there are ones where it just floors me. Um, and but, then, like, how much value does the union really, really give? Right? My wife belongs to a union. She's like works for a school district. Uh huh. And like, like, what are you getting for the value you give this money? Right. I know that's true. It depends on. You know, it's just an amount. Yeah, there's there's certain teachers unions where 
it's necessary. I think that um, Seattle especially is a place where, from what I've heard, and I don't actually know any teachers here, so I'm basing this off of news reports and things like that. Um, teachers get really good, really good pay here in comparison to maybe the middle of America, for instance. Um, so my, my sister is an Ohio, was an Ohio teacher for a long time. And I felt like the union was a really good thing for her being a teacher in Ohio. Um, but then there are, there are other teachers out there who will say the exact opposite. So who really knows unless you're in it? And at the same time, you can look at, um, for instance, what is it, yellow trucks that just went under, um, that whole trucking line that just yeah, completely went out, out of business. The truck drivers aren't getting hired anywhere. And they're not getting hired anywhere because they were in a union. Yeah. And like the strike going on now, I think the auto, auto, American yeah. auto workers. Yeah. The UAW. Like they, they want like, like 32 hour work weeks, 80% increase in pay. I'm like, who's going to like, like, I don't know. Like maybe it makes economic sense. Maybe it's what they deserve. I don't know. But like, on the, like how you gonna make these cars working 30 hours a week? I don't, I don't know. Well, what's interesting is it used to be that we all had seven day work weeks and it was Ford that pushed for a five day work week specifically because nobody had time to go and buy cars. Yeah. So um, I, I think that the concept of a four-day work week makes total sense. We did a four-day four work week at Killer. Um, we were far more successful with a four-day work week now, than we still, were with five. Was it four tens or, or like oh, only 32 hours a week? We did four tens. Um, and the way we set it up was um, half of the team was off on Mondays, half the team was off on Fridays. So the company was still open five days a week, which was important for our clients. They could always get a hold of people. But there's this, you know, it's kind of that law of diminishing returns idea. You come into work on a Monday and you're refreshed. You're, if you like your job, you're ready to work. You're excited. If you don't like your job, you have a yeah. case of the Mondays. But for the most part, if you like your job, you're ready to work, you're excited. And your productivity is, let's say, 100% that day. Maybe it goes down to 90% on Tuesday, but by Wednesday, it's like 60%. By Friday, you're at 40%. And so why are you in the office all day if your productivity is only 40%? If you're working four days a week and you have a three-day weekend, you're still going to get the law of diminishing returns over four days, but you're going to have probably a 100% day, a 90% day, 80, and then 70. So you're going to get much more productivity in the week regardless. And then if you take Wednesday as your day off, that's a whole other story. If we all did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday, and then weekends off, I believe that we'd have about 90% productivity every day you're in the office. Um, at that point, it pays in dividends in comparison to a five-day work. And people don't realize the benefit of taking a day off during the week because like, that's like running errands, right? You go yeah. to the Saturday, Thousand people there. You want to air on Wednesday or Thursday? Like, there's hardly anyone there, right? Except exactly. for Costco. Everyone's always in Costco, right? So we can't, can't talk about Costco. That's like true. That. And there's also the concept of you not wanting to give up your one day off on the weekend because, you know, Sundays are often Sunday scaries. So people don't do a lot on a Sunday anyway. You don't want to give up your Saturday running errands because that's your, that's your only day yeah. to just be with your family, to be with your friends. Um, so, yeah, I do think that. The whole country needs a four-day work week. Um, and, and I think that the only reason we're doing a five-day work week is because tradition. tradition. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely think you should allow, allow, if you can, let people work when they can. Obviously, you know, if you're a fire person or nurse, you know, you have to schedule. But if you're like, like stuff we're doing, like, does it matter when you come to work, you know? I don't mm -hmm. think it does, right? As long as people do. I know, I know like a, a lot of people say, well, I want to be here nine to five because see what they're doing. If they're at home, well... You can still see what they're doing, right? Yeah. It's, I don't get it right. So here's one for you. What's your take on this? This is my personal opinion. From my time in the Army, my couple post-Army jobs, working in startups, right? To me, 80% of the people, let's well, suppose two people are going to pay $30 an hour, right? 80% mm -hmm. of them are going to be like, I'm only getting paid $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to do this amount. I'm only yeah. going to do this right. Yep. And, and like, they never on time. Well, other 20% are like, oh, man, I'm getting paid $30 an hour. I need to prove I'm making this company sixty dollars an hour. I need to prove I'm valuable, right? I'm, you know, I'm. They need me, right? And of course, the boss, like, oh man, this person is like really doing extra. Let me give him a raise. Yep. The person and the eighty percent drop. Oh shit, I'm getting discriminated against. I'm getting, you know, abused, right? Has that been your experience, or am I making this up? 
not with the employees I hired, but I've, I've witnessed it in other jobs. Yes. And that comes back to, I believe that if you hire and fire by your, by your values, and if you show your team that you're living your values on a regular basis as a company, you get the best output because your team feels respected. And I think that's what's the most important thing. I feel like we hired some people who, honestly, I could have been paying them nothing. They were so happy to be doing the work that they were doing and loved the people they were working with. Um, I'm glad I didn't pay them nothing, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> when you hire the right people and you have a clear mission and vision as well that everybody's aligned on, it's the salary isn't the, what determines how much effort you're going to put in. And it never should be. Um, let me restate that. It should be if you're paying people horribly. Um, I know a couple of people where I keep telling them to leave their jobs right now because they're not getting paid their worth and they are putting everything in and they're the only ones living the values of the company that they're working at. Um, so, you know, it does, everything depends on the circumstances of, the job and the company that you're in. Who are some marketing people that you either follow or you admire? Ooh, let's see here. Um, I really got to think on that because this is going to be super old school. Um, but I admire the crap out of Guy Kawasaki. I've read every single one of his yeah, books. We're going to talk about him later on. We talk about your book. Um, Seth Godin. Um, as well. Yeah, I get his like his little blog things every day. Yeah. It's like four or five sentences, nothing too long, but always like insightful and impactful. Right. And I just started um, subscribing to Ben's Bytes and I'm really loving that. Um, it's a news feed all about AI and different ways to be using AI right now. Um, but what I'm finding is a lot of great marketers out there haven't made a name for themselves yet. And instead, you know, you can follow them a bit on Medium and hopefully they'll start to really grow in name over time. Um, but that's been the other thing, my medium reading list. I started diving into medium on some AI stuff and then realized, why am I not paying for medium? It's what I think 40 or $50 a year. So you're a big medium person. I am now. Yeah. Um, as of three weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I do really love that. And then, um, I really follow, follow, uh, Nancy Duarte as well. Um, she's mainly focused on visual communication and, and creative strategy. Um, and I follow everything she says and puts out there. Is there an upcoming agency in Seattle that's not affiliated with material that you like, like you're really a big fan of? Ah, oh, geez. I actually don't have an answer for that okay. because I've kind of purposefully unplugged. Okay. okay. Um, so I, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I will say, I think it's called, uh, there's one agency that my, um, cousin might still be working at. I haven't checked her LinkedIn in a while, but it's called Frog. Um, and what's so interesting about them is basically every project they do, they do in an eight week, on an eight week timeline, no matter how big. Um, and that takes so much skill to do. That takes the most, the most seasoned project managers to do that kind of work. The most seasoned designers, the most seasoned marketers. Um, so I haven't really followed much beyond what she's told me, but if, if she's still there, then shout out to frog. So suppose someone's on, either in college or like they want to do a career change and, and, and they have a light bulb moment. You know what? I want to be a marketer. Mm -hmm. What's your advice to them? Um, I personally think that, you know, if you want to be in marketing, you don't have to go to school for marketing. Step one is dive into LinkedIn learning and take some marketing courses on LinkedIn learning because that's where people are already doing it daily are the ones teaching that content. Um, whereas in school, you're going to half the time get a professor that um, hasn't actually touched it in 15 or 20 years. Um, so jump into LinkedIn learning. And then if you still really like it, look for an entry level job and work your way up. And the best entry level job in marketing is a startup. Because if you can go into a can startup, say that again? <laughs> the best entry level job in marketing is a startup. Um, and I believe that because at a startup, you can make mistakes. You have a bit more freedom to experiment 
And you're going to touch everything as a marketer at a startup. Um, you're going to kind of be a CMO without ever having the experience and you're going to fail. You're going to fail a lot if you don't trust your data and let your data lead you. Um, but it's, you're going to have more ownership over the outcome at a startup um, before you go risk the big money of a client or something at a large company. How should a startup founder hire the first marketing person? That's a good question. So we hired our first marketing person because he was funny. Um, and then he uh, became our CMO and to this date is still one of my best friends. Um, so but we hired him because he was funny. Um, I think that, first of all, if you've never done any marketing and you're a startup founder, you probably shouldn't be the one hiring a marketer. You should get a friend who's a good marketer to do the interviewing and hire that marketer because there are so many ways to fake marketing and it's very easy to sniff out if you're used to marketing. But if you're, if you haven't ever lived in marketing, there's terminology that you won't necessarily use in the interview process. And that terminology can really help you determine does this person have the skill set or not. Um, but if they're entry level and they've never done marketing before, then throw scenarios at them and ask them what they would do. Because at that point, what you're really trying to figure out is are they creative enough to identify solutions to big marketing problems? Um, they might not know how to execute those solutions just yet, but if they can start thinking on the solutions, then you can put them through some marketing training courses that will get them to the place where they can start learning to execute. But I mean, my first marketing job, um, I read SEO for dummies and then started applying for SEO jobs. And this was in 2006. Um, I started applying for SEO jobs and knew all the keywords and ended up getting a job as the head of SEO at a company, um, but luckily had good mentorship and um, was taught a lot while I was on the job. Um, and I was eager to learn. So every week I finished another book on marketing. And that's where I fell in love with Guy Kawasaki and Seth Godin and started digging through all their content, for instance, to understand high level theory for marketing. Um, and then I was following um, anything that would come out of Google as well. Um, and I was connected to somebody who owned an SEO agency and he mentored me for a while. So giving somebody who's eager to learn and eager to take, eager to dive into marketing, giving them a good mentor is also very helpful. And I think a lot of marketing people like to mentor other marketing people because nerds like getting nerdy about things <laughs> and I'm a happy nerd. I love getting nerdy about that stuff. So what's your take on this? So marketing and sales collaborate with each other. So sales report on marketing, marketing and sales, also sales and marketing both report like a chief revenue officer. That's a great question. Um, marketing and sales should collaborate with each other. And I do. I mean, can you call the time? Sales like we can't do the sales. The marketing leads are fucking sucky, right? Yeah. The market says these are actually great leads. You suck at sales, right? Yes, exactly. And that's where when you work together, you identify the persona that you're targeting and what the value of a lead is. And then as you identify that together, you come up with targets for A leads and B leads. How many A leads you're going to get a week? How many B leads you're going to get a week, et cetera. Um, so marketing and sales, in my opinion, must work together. I do think that the best way to do it would be to have a sales lead and a marketing lead report to one person um, versus sales reporting to marketing and marketing should not report to sales. Um, marketing shouldn't report to sales because sales is going to be so focused on immediate outcome and marketing is a passive game for the most part. It takes a long time and it, it's, constantly planting seeds and letting them grow, which can really frustrate somebody in sales and they're less likely to want to take the time to understand it. Sales should never report to marketing because a lot of marketers aren't going to get on the phone and have those hard conversations. And therefore there's not going to be an empathy or a respect for the job of sales. Um, but if you have somebody that sales and marketing reports to, um, and I, it wouldn't be a VP of sales or a VP of marketing. It would have to be maybe 
a COO or something like that. So maybe it's the CMO and the VP of, or the CMO and the, the chief rainmaker or whatever reporting up to um, a COO. So I just thought this meme I saw a long time ago, where the meme was like, like these market people were dancing, right? It was like a thousand people open an email, a little small click, but no one clicked the link. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So what, what is business development? Is that the same thing as marketing sales, business development, something totally different? So business development is a bit of a combination of both. Um, I've heard it defined differently by so many different business developers. Um, the idea of business development is you already have a product or service in front of you, and now it's your job as the business developer to build the client pool. And you might do that through marketing tactics. You might do that through sales enablement, um, but you're going to come up with all the different ways to drive revenue into the business. Um, so my old business partner, he was a business developer. And so he came in as our chief revenue officer because his focus was how do I drive revenue into this business? And that meant sometimes um, working with our CMO, coming up with marketing tactics, other times identifying um, different initiatives for clients. Um, other times just building full on contact lists and doing a lot of cold calling. So business development is really in its purest form, identifying the revenue centers for the company and then driving revenue into the company. Okay. So most typical tech startups or they have, they have three co-founders, right? One does the development, mm -hmm. one is marketing, one is something else. I suppose they, they're doing well. What employee number should the marketing, marketing person be? Employee number five, number two, when you should hire uh, an actual in-house internal hire, like W-2 marketing person? Our very first hire was marketing. Um, it's kind of that uh, field of dreams idea, you know? <laughs> it, the, it works if you're that, like if you're Kevin Costner, it works. <laughs> exactly. It, the world of if you build it, they will come only exists for Kevin Costner. Um, <laughs> Like Yellowstone's a good example of that. Um, it only exists for Kevin Costner. Um, so ultimately, if you have a product, you need somebody to take that product to market. And, you know, you need marketers. Um, you also need people to fulfill on that product. So obviously, if you don't have a product to bring to market yet, then you need to hire the people to build the product yeah. first. This is a balance, right? Like, I know so many people... Like they're, they're tech people, they build a product, no one wants it. And so many non-tech founders like me do marketing, marketing, marketing. And like, well, you can't, what's the those saying they should have on there? Like you can't sell um, shaving cream to a woman or something like that, you know? Like mm -hmm. yeah, you have to have something to show, right? Yes, exactly. MVP minus a beta test or something, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have something first. So change the subject real fast. Back to director stuff. What's a movie or TV series that you were like, man, I wish I could direct one episode of that? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. It's going to have to be a series. Um, I'm so into TV series now. Um, I think that they've replaced my love for movies, actually, because I like. Like, people don't realize, like, I know they said the Golden Age TV like the 50s. I think there's a second age of Golden TV, right? Yes. There was so much great stuff out there. Of course, there's trash out there, too, but there's so much great stuff. And there's so much TV, right? It's like, it's ridiculous. Apple. YouTube, it's like crazy. And you actually just gave me the the one, Severance oh, oh, on wow. Apple. Oh, cool. And that's just because, um, so Ben, uh, why am I forgetting his name? Ben Stiller, it, he directs most of them. But the directing is mind blowing. The, the concept is so surreal and the set is so minimal. So I think that would be really fun to direct an episode of that. That would be, a really cool challenge. So my, my problem has always been, I always get TV shows like past the day, right? Like I got into it, like Big Bang Theory, like, uh -huh. like second to last season. I just binge watched Game of Thrones. Uh, yeah. I watched the whole eight seasons. Sorry like, about like the TV. ending. Yeah. It's like the wires are like, yeah, we're done. Fuck this shit. It's exactly. Like, exactly. George R. R. Melkin or whatever his name is, hadn't written the final book. So they were like, we can do it. Apparently you couldn't. No. Apparently you could not. That, you know, and then like, um, remember the series on HBO called Rome? Mm -hmm. like, I, I compare Game of Thrones to Rome because Rome yeah. had a great, in the last scenes, like, what the fuck is this? Right. Like, what happened, right? I compare Rome to Game of Thrones, right? Both that were done wrong. Yeah, exactly. 
But what was done really well that I think is a good example of what kicked off this current age is Breaking Bad. Oh, yeah. I mean, they knew the ending. Who knows? Max in the middle of the day was such a good actor. I know, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. And the thing is, is uh, Vince, Vince Gilligan, I think that's his name, the writer, um, director of Breaking Bad, um, knew how it was going to end before doing the whole yeah. show. And if you watch the whole show again, you'll see that in episode one, there are all of these scenes that foreshadow the very final episode, yeah. um, which is amazing. It's, it's, that is phenomenal. And then Better Call Saul was just so good. I hated the first season of Better Call Saul, yeah. but then you really get into it. And that was another one where I actually feel like that by the end of it was better than Breaking Bad. Yeah, the, like the acting on these TV shows, it's mm -hmm. like, and then like Apple, Amazon Prime. Yep. It's like so much good stuff out there, you know? Yes. So I'm a big fan of, you ever watch Rick and Morty? Yeah. I'm um, a big fan. So, I, well, the only thing I love Rick and Morty, then every time the new season comes right, I, I found a new season, I found like Monday afternoon, like 4 p.m., that the first episode was like Sunday night. Oh, shit. Right. Like no one tells you, right? And then, like, I know they, they had like new voice actors. Yes. It's, yeah. To me, it sounds the same. So the, not for solar opposites. The solar, oh, yeah. That, that so was now, so funny. To me, that's trippy, right? Because, like, I like solar opposites. Like, I take over the case, like, that's Rick. Yeah. It's like Rick. It's so, so the same, yeah. Yeah, but then it, with solar opposites, I don't know if you saw the latest season, um, but because they had to, um, I, I don't know the, the guy's name, but the actor who played Rick was the, the co-creator. Yeah. Um, I know they actually found, like, they dropped charges or something, right? So, he was Me Too'd. Okay. Um, yeah. That's another thing, right? Like, like, Me Too was good, but, like, it's a negative thing like, to you, I think, right? Like, did you bring him back because he's found not guilty? Like, I don't know. It's like complicated I, questions, I think. I think that if you, um, well, I'm actually not familiar enough with it to actually give an opinion on it as I'm saying it. I was about to make a big statement just because I'm a huge Me Too proponent, and I was about to defend Me Too, but I really can't do it in this case because I haven't done any yeah. um, reviewing on what happened. But I do think that the way they kind of solved for it with Solar Opposites was really funny. Because um, his his voice was replaced by um, the the guy from Legion, um, oh, okay, yeah. who also Legion yeah. saw that after the fact years later, yeah. and fell in love with that. Started watching that during COVID. That was an amazing show. Um, but that actor from Legion is now the voice uh, for Terry um, in the show, and it's a completely different voice. And they they basically did this whole sketch or part of it in the beginning where he gets hit with a voice modulator. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense. I had like maybe a, a voice transplant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Rick and Morty. It's just, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. I know with the Me Too movement, right? I know like, like back in the day when it started, people would say believe women. I was like, I was like, of course, I'm going to put some social media, I'll get blasted. Like, can we believe women who tell the truth, right? I think that for the most part, you can. And that's the issue is women forever have been doubted. Yeah. And the whole point of the movement is to stop doubting women to yeah. stop questioning women especially like evidence that some bash went on right you don't always have evidence yeah. i mean are you recording every single date you're on i mean it's it's it's, true. it's really hard to get evidence for something like that um so i i think that i've never met a woman who hasn't had an experience yeah. that was negative and um potentially traumatic in their life um never I, every single woman i've ever met has had a story this came to my mind. I can remember I heard it from like, so there's this lady, she always take the elevator, right? And the man was like, hey, elevators, like take 10 minutes, just walk the stairs. Mm -hmm. And the lady's like, there's no cameras in the stairs, right? Like, yeah. Like, oh shit. You know, like, okay. Like, yeah, get exactly. It, right? Yeah. Exactly. That is the thing. It's hard. Um, you know, like, if you're a lady, like a guy walks behind you, he's just walking behind you or he's stalking you, right? Yeah. It's the other night. Um, like I said, I like to walk all the time. So we were walking home from Capitol Hill one night, um, just last week. And this guy was walking up towards us at such a speed that both my wife and I really like your hands on up. A swivel. Yes. And we started, you know, hoofing it going as fast as we could. Um, and then we kept turning around and we'd see him turn around and look at us. And that was just one of those situations where, you know, we're always on high alert. Yeah. We don't like to best walk at best night best anymore. Seattle, yeah. Yeah. There was one time we used to love walking at night in Seattle. Um, and now we definitely don't do it much anymore. But there was one time we were walking home from the movies and somebody was coming up very close to us and we were so tensed up and I'm holding on to my mace 
And then I look, I'm like, oh, it's a woman. And immediately I just get yeah. super calm. Everything was great. It was fine. Um, but that's the thing. Sometimes we can see women walking really fast in front of us because we're very fast walkers. And so I'll kind of shout out, hey, I'm a woman, don't worry. Yeah. And then you see, you see their shoulders yeah. just come down, all the tenseness drops. And that, that is the hard part about being a woman um, yeah. is you do live in constant I mean, every time, I, every time I'm walking, you know, like on my phone, I pinch in, I, I'm right. Like, oh, shit. I'm too close to this lady, right? Mm -hmm. Back up. Oh, shit. I, I apologize, you know? Yep, exactly. And that's the other thing, though, is, which I noticed a lot in Seattle. We have a lot of utterly amazing men in this city. Um, and there is a very big awareness that I think exists here and in other cities, but I've noticed it a lot here. Um, especially where men are very open about saying, Hey, I'm sorry. Am I too close? Or don't worry. I'm not a threat. Anything like that. Um, because of just an awareness of what a woman might be feeling in that moment, that the me too movement is something that woke everybody up to that. It, I think the biggest thing about the me too movement is all of us women were having these conversations in quiet to each other, to friends if we felt comfortable enough to have these conversations and making it a national conversation changes the entire playing field. It's empowering for all of us. It gives, it gives us a language. That's the other big thing I've talked about a lot. Um, there are certain things like the idea of gaslighting, for instance, or love bombing. Um, the, these terms that have come out in the past or become our, part of our national vernacular in the past five years um, that we were never taught as women. And when you're taught a term like that, and then you're given the definition of the term, it's empowering because you suddenly realize, oh, so this whole thing that I was going through that made me feel so dirty inside and so just icky around this person, I now have a term for it that can quickly define it so I can recognize it faster and extricate myself from the situation faster. Um, language is such power when used correctly and knowledge is power. And when we don't talk about these things and we, we keep them so, so quiet and, and, um, too personal instead of sharing with the world, we don't empower the women of the world or the men to fight those things. So I think that that has been one of the most positive aspects of the Me Too movement is building this conversation, building this vernacular, and giving women the tools and men the tools to recognize certain behaviors um, in a way where none of us feel like we have to be polite. Uh, a conversation my wife and I were having the other day, which we also say is because we're in our 40s, we're doing this now, but we don't care about being polite anymore. I, I don't care if it makes you feel bad that I'm walking very far around you um, if we're both walking at night on the same path and I go give you a wide breadth as a man. I used to not want to hurt somebody's feelings and still just, you know, walk really close. And, and at times that leads to a grab or something like that. And so um, I don't care anymore. <laughs> And I think that's the other thing is women, I, I always say to my dad, um, at least women of our generation and generations before us, but I don't think, I hope not with younger generations, are raised to say, I'm sorry, while men have been raised to say, I want. And I don't want, I'm sorry to be um, the difference between my safety or not, you know? Yeah, I think one thing we get wrong is like, you know, if you have like a young son, you teach him to fight, wrestle, mm -hmm. young lady. I think, I think yeah. it's even more important to teach a young lady or a young girl how to fight, how to like, you know, yes. shoot a gun, how to kick some of the nuts, how to throw someone out. Everybody. Yeah, exactly. you know, I think everyone needs to learn, should learn, whatever your, your sex age, whatever it is, you should learn how to fight. Like someone comes, picks you up. I mean, there's some horrible fucking people in the world, right? If someone grabs you off the corner of the bus stop, you should be able to like, you know, do something quickly, no matter your age, right? I think we get that wrong. We teach kids, you yeah. know, like what, you know, like what's the thing? Like if a little boy runs a mother, oh, he's just a boy. A girl does it. Oh, don't do that, princess. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, it's 
it, it made me laugh a little bit when you said kick them in the nuts because uh, the funny story I always tell people, I don't always tell people this, but I'm sharing it now with the world. Um, I think I was like in first grade and out on the playground, we had something called the fighting tree where all the boys would go and wrestle. And um, I would go out to the fighting tree because I was a total tomboy. And um, I'd be wrestling with the guys and everything. And one day out of the blue, I learned to kick them in the nuts. And they would line up to be kicked in the nuts because all these guys, yeah, no joke. All these guys were just like, you can't hurt me. How is she hurting everybody? How is she making everybody fall down? And it would just be this line of both. And that was, yeah. So future scientists of the world, well, future geniuses of the world, right? <laughs> so I just saw this. I wonder, um, maybe it's a, a, a study on this. Like, what percentage of tomboys going to be like like super successful? Right? I know. I do kind of wonder that. I do think that it's part of empowerment. I think that I used I used to joke that when I go into a conference room, I act like a straight white male. That was my joke. Um, but that was because I had a lot of women ask me, why is it that, you know, we see you speak, we see you do this, and uh, we've been in a conference room with you, and we see you take control of the room. What are you doing differently? And so I would say, well, it's, I'm, I feel like I deserve to be heard, and I just act like a straight white male. <laughs> um, in reality, that's not actually what's going on in my head. I had um, the luck of not just being raised by my mom and dad, but by my older brother and older sister and watching them. Um, and we were a very tight knit family um, and still are. I mean, my sister is my absolute best friend. Um, we were just last weekend um, in Nashville for my mom's 70th birthday, my whole family. Um, and that was amazing. Um, but, you know, my dad and my mom, taught me to go after what I wanted and encouraged me constantly. Something as simple as that, right? Yeah. They constantly encouraged me. And honestly, there's something about being said, being told I love you every day. I mean, my parents said, I love you to me every day. And, um, they cut me off from any money at 14. So I had to go get my own job, you know, and that's, that's child abuse. This is day and Well, they, they still paid for plenty. <laughs> they just basically said, you're not making an allowance anymore. If you want to make, make more money to go do your fun things, you need to go get a job. Um, so they taught me young to work for my own enjoyment. Um, and, you know, my brother's five, four and a half to five years older than me right now. We're at four and a half years, but uh, that's because I just turned 41. But a couple of days ago, it was yeah. five years in reality. It's, it's just four and a half years. Um, but my brother has always been somebody who I've looked up to um, in so many ways. He is just incredibly smart. He commands a room, absolutely commands That's a room. That's a skill. A lot of people don't have that. He's so good at it, and he does it so thoughtfully. Um, and and he he thinks before he says anything. He's the he's the type of person who just doesn't um, spew words to get people to listen to him. Everything is clearly thought out before he says anything. Um, so I always wanted to emulate him. Um, I always wanted to emulate my dad and my mom. Um, and then on top of it, my sister is just the most passionate out of all of us. So I just feel like, um, you know, watching everything my sister has always done with um, her career and her trajectory, her growth and her creativity, um, I lucked out. I basically had four parents raising me, um, making me this way as opposed to two. Can you talk about the importance of investing in personal relationships? That is exactly um, why I'm here today. What I, where I am today in my life is about investing in personal relationships. Um, I believe that the only thing you get out at the end of the day are the people around you who you love. Um, if you're not investing in your personal relationships, you're going to end your life with very few people around you and in your corner. Um, but I had to learn that the hard way. So I guess to say the importance of it would be the lesson and the way I learned it. I left Seattle, I left Cleveland. 
um, in 2004. I just graduated college. I was 21, moved out here and um, had the loneliest year of my entire life. Um, was just utterly terrified and alone living in here in the city for my first year. Um, especially on second and Yesler, we were above a methadone clinic. Uh, we being me and my dog, uh, we were above a methadone clinic. Um, yeah, second and Yesler is definitely uh, like a different place. Yeah, it, it, it hasn't improved much, um, but it is currently better than it was in 2004. Are you serious? Oh, yes. Every time I catch a bus, I'm always, my head's always from like walking around, looking at different people. I'm always like on, like, not on it, but like I'm, I'm very aware of my surroundings. I catch the bus. And like if the bus leaves at 5 or 1, I try to get there at 5 p.m. Yes. One day, uh, my dog was barking like crazy at the window, and I always had my blinds shut because I was on the first floor. I always had my blind shut because I was, uh, you know, just didn't want people looking in. He's barking like crazy at the window. So I go and I open the blinds and there's a guy who, it had to have been heroin based on uh, how he was, was just staring at his reflection in the window with drool coming way down. I'm like, okay, well, this is basically in my living room. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is I learned that moving 2000 miles away from my family, I learned how important my family was how important family was. Um, I was going to leave this city um, and I love this city so much. I'm so glad I'm still here, but I was going to leave and move back home until I met my wife in um, early 2006. Um, and I think that when you fall in love in a city, you fall in love with the city even more. Um, but her focus, cause she had moved from, um, from Arizona. So she had moved away from family, but her sister was here. Her focus was family too. So we made a commitment to each other that we would build a life that would allow us to spend as much time as possible in our hometowns and be with family as much as possible, um, which is exactly what we did. Every decision we've ever made professionally has been to lead to this point where um, I'm in Ohio every six weeks or so, seeing um, my niece and nephew. Um, I haven't gotten down to, uh, Florida where my brother lives to see his kids enough at, at all yet. They just moved there. Um, but I got to get down there. Um, we're in Phoenix as much as we can, um, to be with family there. Family is so important and your family is not just who you're related to by blood. Your family is who you make. Um, and we have friends who I would lay down in traffic for. I love them like crazy. Um, and I just don't see the value, I'm like at 40, especially, I don't see the value in life if it isn't to spend your time with the people you love. I think that's the most important thing. And my wife really taught me that um, as well. I have always defined my value by my career and she defined her value by the people who she surrounded herself with. And I'm glad she taught me that. And I learned to adopt that because it's much better. This one thing I learned recently, right? If you don't get this right, like suppose like suppose someone's 50 years old and they have a kid who's 30, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, suppose it's a dad and they're like, okay, I'm probably living 72. I'm going to see my kid for 20 more years. Yep. No. Exactly. You're going to see them maybe 20 more times. Yeah, you that's know, true. Maybe if you're lucky, 44 more times, right? You know, if you're not seeing him every day. You only see him like, you know, maybe a weekend, especially you live in different places, right? Even yep. if you live in the same city, right? You're yep. different life, you know, might spend the weekends, but... You have a limited amount, of time, limited amount of time with everyone in the world, right? Exactly. And so why spend time with people you don't like or don't like you, right? You know, spend a time with people like, you know, your family, close friends, you know, or people like add value to, you know? And that's also been a thing that I think COVID forced us all to learn as well. Um, I shed a lot of um, dead weight during COVID, if you will. Um, I realized that there were a lot of people who I was bringing value to their lives professionally, maybe. Yeah. Um, but they weren't bringing any value to my life. Um, and it was time to shed that weight. Yeah. And I do think like COVID was just the worst global experience we could all have. But if we could take some lessons from it, I think that is the most important lesson that you do only live once yeah. that life is so fleeting and you have to embrace the people you love and spend your time around them as much as possible. So you're like this, right? So I'm an introvert, right? Introvert's introvert, right? Uh -huh. So co-restorative, man, this is the greatest thing ever, right? I want to talk to people and I'm like, yep. God damn, I need to talk to someone. 
I don't want to talk to my wife again, right? I need to meet someone else. Like, please, like anyone, right? So it's funny because I'm a total extrovert and my wife's a total introvert. And so we balance each other out in that way. Um, but COVID kind of made me go a bit more introverted, um, surprisingly. And part of that was because um, we have so much fun together that we were really enjoying having all that time. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, but another big part of it was because I was realizing I was getting so much validation from friendships that weren't going to last, you know, this stuff. Yeah, Maybe exactly. Maybe buddies or whatever case may be. Exactly. And so I did start to kind of learn to focus on a few versus a many. Um, and it's been the, the past couple of years of friendships have probably been the most rewarding friendships in my entire life, um, simply because they're all intentional. We've all chosen to prioritize each other. Yeah. So moving on. So you're the chief business strategist on several boards. Mm -hmm. Two Parker, what is that? And what makes you say yes to being on the board? How does someone convince you to be on the board? So uh, what it is, is I have a lot of people who come to me looking for advice on how to engage customers and bring customer loyalty. And my belief is it's through quality visual content. So when I say chief visual strategist, it's what is your visual strategy as a company? What is your brand? What is your brand promise? And how are you showing that to your audience? What content are you regularly putting out? And how are you valuing your audience's time by ensuring that the content is high quality in its visual appeal as well as textual appeal? Um, so it's kind of about building that overarching visual um, language for a company to communicate with their audience. Um, when it comes to what makes me say yes, a couple of the boards are simply really good friends who own agencies who came to me and said, can you please be on my board? Um, and a couple of them are just really exciting endeavors that I think can bring positive change to the world. And I think that's a big part of it is positive change. I, um, I don't like where our society is right now. And I do fully believe that one of the ways to bring people together is the same way we're, bring, we're separating people. And that is visual content. People will look at, for instance, I'll take the 2016 election. I mean, the amount of memes that were put out there, regardless of who you voted for, um, let's say you voted Hillary, um, you were seeing memes of Trump with text overlaid, that wasn't anything maybe he ever said. Most likely it was something he didn't say, but you believe he said it because the text was on top of a photo of him. If you were a Hillary fan, it was the same thing. Text on top of a photo and suddenly you believe that she said this or she did this. Um, Pizzagate. All of Pizzagate was based on visual content that was falsified, but people believed it. We believe what we see and it, we live in a world of constant propaganda. Nobody wants to call it propaganda, but that's what it is. And to combat the propaganda machine, there's got to be something better out there. Um, and so there are some places that I, I have affiliations with that I'm really excited about what they might be able to bring to the table. But visual content is such an important tool in that toolbox. It's, it's one of the most powerful ways to convey information to people today because people aren't taking the time to read and we don't have the time to read. So how many boards are you on right now? Three. Is that your limit? No. Wait, no. What's your limit you think? Depends on how often uh, we're meeting. I have Is this like a board of advisors? Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, I think that ultimately I probably have the capacity for 10 if they're, the meetings are quarterly or monthly, but these, definitely not more. For these, like you take like a, like a quarter percent of like the equity or like, what's that like? Um, none of them are equity. The ones I'm on, they're cash-based usually. Okay. Um, but there are opportunities. I mean, I would definitely, if it was something where I was really excited about the product, I would go equity in a heartbeat. Um, cause that would be more thrilling to me, I think. Um, and there's a lot more skin in the game versus 
just, you know, a pay to play type experience. Um, one of them is entirely free because I'm excited about, um, what's going on there. And so I want to just be a part of it. Yeah. Back to memes, misinformation. I can't remember the exact meme, but I remember like when Trump was president, like he went to New York city, same exact picture. One new legalization, the devil's come to New York city. He's storing us all going to hell. Another new organization, the son of God has come to say us. Exactly, right. Exactly. Yeah. Same picture. Yes. Exactly. Right. Yes. It's, it's like, man, this is ridiculous. How you contextualize a picture matters. And in the world of AI and deep fakes, oh it's, we're in for a scary have road ahead. The, have you seen the, the Steve Jobs speech? No. About COVID? No. Yeah. I speak Steve Jobs talking about COVID, how it's affecting Apple, how they'll overcome, overcome an Apple, how Apple is going to overcome COVID. I got to imagine there are people who believe that speech entirely and think yeah. it's real I instead mean, of realizing you, he's you, dead. Yeah, you could tell <laughs> it's a little bit off. Okay. But like you miss the offs, you know, like you're not really paying attention to sales like him. But if you pay attention, you oh shit, this is like obviously AI, right? Yeah, exactly. And luckily right now, you can tell that it's AI. But right now. Right now. Yeah. yeah. And that there's there's a lot of scary aspects to AI. There's a lot of exciting aspects to AI. Um and I, I jump back and forth because the scary aspects I hope can be regulated, but if we regulate it, another country is going to use it against us anyway. Um, the exciting aspects of AI are what I try to focus on because what I keep saying to everybody is Pandora's box is open. Oh yeah, it's not closing. Yeah, we're not shoving anything no. back in that box. It's not closed. It's, it's full to full tilt. Yes, and so now we're at a point in life where we all have to say, okay, it's here. How am I going to use it to my advantage? Because if I don't use it to my advantage, it will be used to my detriment. Yeah. And all of us have to embrace it, whether we like it or not. But I keep equating it to computers. When computers came out, the design industry was so apprehensive. They did not want to move from hand-drawn design <laughs> to computer-aided design. Um, and, and we're certain that it was going to be the death of design. We're at, a, we're at that same inflection point. And I read this really good article that basically said, and now I say it in all of my presentations, so I'm sorry for stealing and paraphrasing the line, but it basically said, AI is not going to kill the design industry. It's going to kill the designers of today to give birth to the designers of tomorrow. And you as a designer today, can basically say, do I want to go along for that rebirth or not? Um, but it, it is a scary time right now for yeah. any career. I think with AI, like really worst case scenario, I close a mom and dad tells a kid, hey, we're going out for the night. And we're right, don't open the door, right? Yep. And then an hour later, they get a call. Yeah. You know, hey, this is mom and dad with us a key. But you turn over, like, this is mom and dad, right? Yep. Like, you know, like, and it's fucking some horrible person. Right? Exactly. And that's, I mean, it's terrifying, especially you know, you think about it that way because you're a parent and I think about my parents or any other boomer parents right now um, getting taken advantage of with AI. There was a whole story I read recently where a woman lost her entire so many stories savings. Like that. So many stories, unfortunately. And it's because she thought it was her daughter calling her and that her daughter had been kidnapped and needed $600,000 in um payment to get back and she never thought to call her daughter because yeah. they cloned the phone number and they used an AI voice modulator and that terrifies me um I mean luckily my parents and my in-laws um we talk about those things yeah. they're very aware of it and like I could only imagine if um somebody tried to call my dad he'd probably laugh at them and yeah. <laughs> make fun of them in the process yeah. which would be good so this is a bad right this isn't a bad but Probably just a coincidence, right? So my daughter lives in Texas, in mm -hmm. Arlington, Texas. And she texts us and says, hey, I'm getting a new number. I'll, I'll give you a call tomorrow the new number, right? The next day, I got a call from an Arlington number. Answered it. It was, it, was like a, it was like a call center, right? Yep. So it was probably just a coincidence. Like, man. Or, this, right? This, you're, you're fucking good, right? Because mm -hmm. like, no way I would answer this call if it wasn't a number I didn't recognize. I answered because exactly. my daughter called me. This is my number, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. Like, like, can you talk about this? Talk about how people don't realize, like, how in-depth marketing is, right? Like, I mean, there's a reason, like, like I would not be surprised if I get an ad for bourbon mm -hmm. in 30 minutes, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the whole thing. 
we agree to it. Oh, yeah. We, I mean. We, we got rid of privacy a long time ago. We got rid of privacy a very long time ago. And I also go back and forth on this because my thoughts are, I'm not going to break the law. Um, I'm not doing anything that would make me a person of interest. Um, so therefore, I'm not worried about somebody coming after me because they can hear everything I say and track my movements and all that. Um, in the same vein, the amount of money I spend now because the perfect product is sent to me at the exact right time and I can buy it on a click of a button is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and it's killing what's left of brick and mortar as well. And we're seeing the impacts in our neighborhoods. We're seeing the impacts of um, online retail taking over. So it's like, I've got this huge level of convenience. I have entertainment at my fingertips. That's just fed to me. Millions of whatever you want. Yeah. So there are things that I'm, I love it. I absolutely love it. I also hate it. <laughs> it is a love hate relationship. And um, as we add facial recognition into it, which is historically racist, it's terrifying because we're going to hit a whole new era of false accusations. Um, and I do worry about a future society that trusts the AI and trusts the data too much. Um, as I've been saying, trust your data for marketing. Um, <laughs> I worry about a society that can't um, regulate it with just critical thinking. We do have a, um, a, a huge loss of critical thinking um, in our society at large, globally, um, that, that has been built for a good 20 or 30 years. I feel like ever since No Child Left Behind in the 90s, that started forcing teachers to teach to the test. We've moved to a world where kids aren't taught critical thinking until their very first job. And then employers are really angry and aggravated by it because they come from a generation where critical thinking was just common. And now they're suddenly realizing that they're not getting it from fresh out of college employees. So it's a, it's a uh, issue to yeah. say the least. So talk about how do you become like a, such a good public speaker, what, what was the process of you enjoying public speaking so much? That was all thanks to um, a man named John Mercer, um, who was my teacher in high school. He was, um, he was my history teacher, my uh, AP US history teacher. And I am horrible at history, so I don't know how I got an AP, but I did somehow. Uh, he was my history teacher. He was my theater director. Um, and his wife, Ruth Mercer, um, was um, his coach, uh, co-coach for speech and debate. And I never could get a good role in theater. I'd always try out, always try out, never get a good role. And he came up to me one day and said, you have a good stage presence. You're not an actor. But I think that you would be very good in original oratory and speech and debate. And original oratory is basically a TED talk. Um, and so I said, okay, cool. I mean, he was, was and always will be my absolute favorite teacher. Um, to this day, I think I owe much of my career to him. And what grade was this? This was, I had him a couple of years, but uh, junior year is when I started speech and debate. Um, so yeah, he was, um, he recognized something and he encouraged it. And then because his wife helped him coach, she further encouraged it. Um, she's actually the first adult I ever came out to. And that's because she came up to me and she was like, so, uh, you told your parents you're gay yet. <laughs> so, I mean, they, those two, um, to this day, just go down in, in the books as some amazing people. Uh, my wife invited them to my 35th birthday party, my surprise birthday party that I had in Cleveland. She invited them there, which is great. Um, but yeah, he encouraged me to do speech and debate. And um, I got into original oratory two years in a row, um, went to nationals my um, final year. So I loved it. I realized that that was what I really, really loved doing. 
And then I had a couple of opportunities to do it through previous jobs where my bosses had recognized that I had a, uh, a knack for it. And so they would ask me to go do a presentation at a conference or something like that. And then basically um, a couple of years in a killer, Adobe reached out for Adobe Max and asked if I'd be willing to speak at Adobe Max. And that catapulted it all from there. Um, and that was when I just started seeking it out and seeking and you out speaking. Pay for these speaking engagements? Um, not really, no. Uh, now I do. But originally, it didn't matter if I got paid. I was getting in front of prospective clients. Or paid off in the long term, so to speak. It did. And people don't realize that. I have a lot of people who reach out to me and say, I want a speaking career like yours. And they just think that, that it can happen overnight. And they think that they can demand a minimum of $10,000 per speaking. Like, who are you? Exactly. What have you done? What's your brand? Like all these questions, right? Exactly. And, and that's the thing. Like I built it and did it for free for a decade. And when I was speaking at the one year that I did 50 conferences, I didn't get paid for a single one of those conferences, but I was in front of clients. I got paid afterwards. I got paid by closing a client. And that's what I would do. I would speak, meet with people, close a client, come home. I tell people this, I don't people realize it. Like if you get in front of any, any crowd, even where five people, 500 people, I don't care what you're talking about. Marketing, HR, firearms, gun control, whatever. They're going to make it assume that you know what you're talking about. Yes. Until of course, until you prove them wrong. Right. Yes. But they're going to assume that this Jason or Amy, they know what the fuck they're talking about. Exactly. Listen, right. Exactly. And that was also where I started to learn over time that some conferences are, were a waste of my time because they were fly by night conferences. There were conferences that were poorly organized or um, just not the right type of audience, what have you. Now I'm in a very different boat. Now that I'm not looking to land a client, um, it's changed things in two ways. One, I can give away the secret sauce when I'm speaking. So I do think that my presentations now are far better than they were before because I'm not holding anything back. I will tell you anything and everything and give you every tool you need. Um, but in addition, now I also am very picky. So I did five conferences this year and my sixth is tomorrow. I'm very picky. I want to make sure I'm um, either at a conference where I'm super stoked about the audience and just want to empower that audience. Um, or it's a conference where um, I am having the opportunity to learn from other people at that conference as well. So I get really picky and I, I only do paid conferences now. What are you speaking at tomorrow? Tomorrow is CoLab. Um, so CoLab is a conference that started this time last year. It was their first time last year. Um, tomorrow's their third time doing it because what they're doing is um, a full conference once a year and a half conference halfway through the year. CoLab is put on by two agencies, Hanson Balea um, and Project Bionic. Um, two awesome agencies, actually. So I guess I should have said those when I was talking about <laughs> awesome agencies in Seattle. Um, so CoLab is meant to be a community conference for marketers to help people in the community of marketing in Seattle really grow. Because before COVID, we had this thriving community. And then so many people left because COVID hit and they could move home and work remotely. And so the community hasn't been thriving as much as it used to. Um, and the point of CoLab is to build up that community and empower people as much as possible. So it's my second year speaking at CoLab. Um, it's a lot of fun because it's a really intimate space. Um, it's about 100 people um, because it's meant to be about, you know, helping everybody learn and having a lot of hands-on experience. It will grow over the years because any first time um, conference to even get to about a hundred people is pretty amazing. Um, so it's continuing to grow each year, but it's a, it's a fun conference. So do people reach out to you for this or you reach out to them for these speaking engagements? Um, for one, I apply every year. Um, and that would be any con content marketing Institute conference. They have a call for speakers and I just apply every year um, because 
they're very particular. They want to make sure they're getting a, a very well-rounded set of topics, just like South by Southwest would. There's no, like South by Southwest never calls people up and says, come speak at my conference unless you're Barack Obama, which they did one year, which was awesome. Um, but, you know, it, for the most part, if you're going to speak at some of the biggest conferences out there, you're going to submit and bid for putting kind of your, your breakdown on a session and hope that they pick you. And they're going to pick you based on, does it work within the program we're building for the year? Um, otherwise, if it's not within um, a South by Southwest, Adobe Max, or a content marketing world conference, um, people are reaching out to me. But those, those three conferences, which are all huge in my world of marketing or design, um, those are ones where you could be speaking there year after year after year and then not in the next year because it just doesn't fit their program properly. They focus on their audience above everything else. And that's why they're amazing conferences. Does your approach to uh, speaking engagement matter on what the, what the topic is or how many people are in front of you? Um, my approach doesn't matter based on how many people are in front of me. Well, no, let me restate that. Let's say I have 10 people in front of me. We're going to have a very fun interactive session at that point. It's not going to be me talking at you. It's going to be us having a discussion at that point. So I will um, immediately alter it. I hadn't had that experience until um, 2021 because everybody's getting back into conferences and people are afraid to go to conferences. So I did a couple of conferences where the online presence was much larger than the in-person presence. And that's when we turned it into a conversation instead. Um, but Ultimately, I try to keep my approach the same. I look at what is the conference looking for and I make sure I'm bringing value to that conference. Um, but I really focus on, um, first of all, a slide deck that's as little text as possible so that people aren't busy reading the slides and not hearing what I'm saying. Um, a slide deck that if people take photos, they have cheat sheets that can help them going forward. And key takeaways that people can walk away from that session and immediately enact so that they're able to accomplish something great. Um, this year it's been all AI. So I'm teaching people how to use AI tomorrow's session, for instance, at CoLab is um, a 20 minute quick session on prompting um, AI in mid journey, how to get the best out of it, how to make great visual content using AI. So you wrote a book mm -hmm. and you got Guy Karashi to the forward. Yeah. And Guy, he's like one of the goats, so to speak, right? Yes. Guy is totally a goat. So like, did you like have a personal relationship with him? And how did no. it come about? I like talk about that process. Because if I saw that, like, hey, she got Guy Karasi. So he's a big deal. Like, I, yeah. I, I, um, Guy Kawasaki is a humble, generous man. Um, he doesn't have any ego. And I think that's how I got him. <laughs> so, um, there, there are three different reasons. The first is one of our first viral infographics that we ever did just for our own promotion was Guy Kawasaki versus Seth Godin. Um, and we had this amazing illustrator who just created a beautiful, beautiful infographic. Um, and it, in it, you know, she illustrated them both in a, um, a boxing match and gave Guy Kawasaki a six pack. Um, and he retweeted it and reposted it. So we were like, we're on his radar. Yay. Um, then years later, um, I was doing something called the visual minute, which was a, a quick hit series video series on visual tips from experts. And we were um, contacting experts that were going to be at South by, we had a booth at South by, we wanted to connect with them and, and interview them on a simple question um, about what makes great visual content. And uh, we were able to get Guy Kawasaki to agree to that interview. So I had had this personal interview with him that lasted five minutes. And that was my only personal interaction with him. I had had the infographic, which was that infographic is why he was willing to do the um, interview with us in the first place because we were on his radar. So I emailed him um, and I, I sent him the transcript of the book. And, um, you know, he's the uh, chief evangelist of Canva. And 
Canva is, you know, making waves and empowering everybody to produce great visual content. So I reached out to him and said, we we both have a mutual, um, a, a mutual belief that great visual content is great content and that, that it can empower people to do, um, amazing things and build brands and, and engage customers in great ways. I would, be so honored and humbled if you would write the foreword of my book. Would you at all be willing to? Here's the transcript. And he got back to me in 24 hours. And I have that, I have that email printed out um, where he responded and said, yes, I mean, made my day, made my life. And I've always promised myself that if I ever get to a point where I have that many books under my, under my helm and I, um, in any way, shape or form have anybody who is as much of a fan girl as I am to Guy Kawasaki, if, if anybody's as much of a fan to me and they want something like that in return, I want to humbly pay it forward, but I got to earn it first. So I got to first earn a uh, Guy Kawasaki level. And that's actually, honestly, my goal in life now is just to be Guy Kawasaki. <laughs> so basically, in his life. So basically you follow the Wayne Gretzky philosophy. You miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Yes, so most exactly. People, most people are like, oh, if I'm an interview in a graphic, there's no, I'm not gonna waste my time. Yep. But you're like, no, no, I'm taking this shot. Exactly. Exactly. And it, that's exactly it. My thought process was if he doesn't respond, what did I lose? Um, Can you talk about this real fast? I could mm -hmm. be wrong about this. Like, it's like most guys would do that. Yes. Most females would not. That's exactly right. What made you like take that shot? No one like most females wouldn't do that. It, the exact idea of the Wayne Gretzky model. Mm -hmm. Like there was no point not to. I mean, honestly. What's he going to do, block you? Yeah. And honestly, if he, there's no way anybody who is as busy as he is, is going to remember my name and say, this stupid person had the audacity to ask got, me this. And, do a 10,000 word blog on LinkedIn. Exactly. And so like I knew, plus, I mean, he's also known to be a gracious, humble person. Um, so I knew that I was approaching somebody who had already been so generous with his time with me before. Um, and, and that in the least, I could at least thank him for that generosity, which was also one of the things I did when I reached out to him. Um, so yeah, I mean, still to this day, I'm, I, I think that he is the best thing since sliced bread. I, I hang on every word when he puts content out. I listen to his podcast. Um, I mean, um, I am so thankful to have had him even endorse my book. Um, yeah, it's a big deal. That's like, yeah, yes, that's, that's bigger than big. Like, fuck. That's, that's, that's how I feel as well. That's how I feel. And it just honestly makes me shoot for the next star because that's also what put me on down this path of saying, that's what I want to do. I want to write a lot more books and I want to create a lot more content. And I want my entire career to be about creating content that empowers people. That's all I want to do. That's why I, um, wanted the senior fellow role. That's why I do all the LinkedIn learning courses I do and will continue to as long as LinkedIn will have me. Um, and next year I'll be putting out another book and I'm, my goal is to do a book a year. Um, and yeah, I mean, if I could even come close to giving somebody the knowledge he gave me in all of his books, um, that would make me feel great. So someone do another drink, one another one, you good? I'm good. Good affair. Okay. To celebrate your book. Oh, thank you. So what's your book about and why even write a book? Mm. Right? Why write a book about yes. visual strategies? Yes. yes. Um, so the book is called Killer Visual Strategies. Um, it was released in 2020. Um, was it February 2020? No. <laughs> it was released in uh, Ju June 25th, 2020, I believe. Um, and was voted the best marketing and sales book of 2020. Um, and it's still on. So who decides that? Um, that was Porchlight Books. So they're a very well-renowned, um, organization that helps publish books, but also is a wholesaler for all published books. And they really, um, kind of lead in, in thought leadership of what a great book and is. And so since God of the Ford, did he have responsibility, like, kind of like 
like a market your book himself or is he just does a forward and that's it? Just did the forward. Yeah, I didn't that's, ask he, for anything He's else. like, that's enough marketing for you. That is we, enough marketing you, we for me. take this forward. Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, no, and and um, I, I'm sure based on his generosity, had I asked for anything, he 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 might likely have given it. Um, but I was just so thankful for what I did get from him. Um, so the book is um, a full breakdown on what visual communication is first and foremost, because if you understand the history of what has led us to a world where our primary communication is visual communication, um, I mean, th there's a reason why emojis are used more than text in texting. Um, it, it, a single emoji encap encapsulates so much more um, than anything else, especially when most of your communication is not verbal anymore. Um, so it goes into detail about the science and the psychology behind visual communication. That's part one of the book. Part two of the book are eight rules that you should follow to ensure that your content is truly visually communicating to your audience so that you get their, uh, get the right engagement from your audience. And then part three of the book is the process to follow, how to ensure that you're creating great content from start to finish. Um, and it's funny because the whole book is about visual communication and it's 40,000 words explaining visual communication. Um, so the book's not a bunch of emojis. No, the book, <laughs> but the book is highly illustrated. Um, my team designed the whole book. Um, that was also a big part of it. When we were working with my publisher, um, I asked if it was okay if my team did all the design work because I wanted to make sure that um, I could be very particular about everything and the layout and how it was put together um, and, and to ensure that we were visually communicating the information at hand. Um, and Wiley is an amazing publisher to work with. So I really was, was lucky to work with Wiley. Um, they, I had always wanted to write the book. I had been thinking for a long time about writing a book about visual communication. And in 2019, um, Wiley reached out to me. I was, I was speaking at Content Marketing World at the time. So I was in a little conference room outside of Content Marketing World trying to talk to my publisher. Um, they reached out to me asking me to write the book. And then um, I wrote it quickly because it had been in my head for so long. So it was, I think we signed the paperwork in October and the book was done and fully designed at the end of December. Um, so yeah. So from concept to publishing was a pretty short time period. It was, but at the same time, the concept had been in my head for 10 years. I had been okay. writing it for, forever. So what made you do the, like, on a push, like, I got to do this now? Because they asked me. Okay. So when you have a publisher come to you and say, you want to do this Pretty book? Good incentive. Instead of self-publishing? Like, hell yeah. <laughs> so that, that was a perfect incentive to do it. And that is exactly why I did it. And I'm very grateful for them to come to me and to, to be a good partner in this book. So for your second book, what's some lessons learned for your first book that you're going to make your first second book writing experience even better? So I actually do have a second book out. Um, it, it's just that it's not really out. Um, I co-wrote a book on how to start your own agency um, with a colleague and we self-published it because it was um, something where we we're basically focusing on how do we just get this book out to as many people as possible, not thinking about profit or anything like that. Um, and then we hit a point where it was so COVID focused that we actually stopped selling it and are going to rewrite it in the next, we're going to update it in the next couple of months and do a much broader re-release next year. Of but, the book. but you're doing a second published book though, right? Um, that will be self-published. Um, and then my hope is next year um, to go for a second published book through a publisher. So when you start agency, like as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what's something like back then you like really struggled with, right? But now you look back and like, what was wrong? You're like, there's no way I still struggle with this. It was so easy to do. Ooh, easy to do is the question. But at the time you're like, man, I'm struggling with this. It's kicking my butt. But now you're like, what? You know, honestly, I guess it was people management. That, 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 that's the best answer. Um, I struggled hard for my first five years. Um, and it was because... My employees saw so many issues, but I did not give them an environment where they could comfortably bring those issues to the table. And so as a result, um, either if the issues were brought up, I was getting offended by it instead of hearing them, 
or it just would boil over to something worse. Um, I had to hire a coach. Um, he taught me a ton. Uh, Keith Upkeys, coach Keith Upkeys. Um, uh, he, he taught me a ton on um, how to humble myself and listen to my team and how to empower my team and give my team an environment where um, we could all grow together and where I could hear their feedback and be better for it instead of letting it, I would, I would take the feedback so personally. Um, and then it would just dig away at me over the evenings and weekends. It was unnecessary. All they wanted was something was to improve the company. And I just wasn't taking it that way. Um, so I think that was probably it. It was, I had never managed people before. It's not easy, right? It's not, it's not easy. And I had always been the youngest at the companies I worked at. So I had never worked with people younger than me who a lot of people we were hiring right out of college where we were their very first experience. So therefore I had these expectations that they were just going to toe the corporate line, if you will, instead of realizing, no, I'm hiring a bunch of creative people and creative people want a say because that's part of being a creative person. Um, it's, it's, you have great ideas and you want a space to share those ideas and you want to know you're heard. And I didn't, I just, I viewed it wrong in the beginning, but luckily I hired the right people. And so despite uh, a few different snafus throughout my first few years, they gave me patience and they gave me grace and helped me, helped me grow and be a better, a better, a better CEO. Looking back at your, your, your time as CEO of the company, what would have had to happen for you to stop? Like what would happen? Like no, maybe like two years of no profit. Like what would happen? You say, okay, maybe I want to be entrepreneur, but maybe this is not for me. Yeah, I would have had to run out of money, and yeah. that that that's the thing I actually tell a lot of people who want to start their own company. The first thing that's going to stop you is you run out of money, and so I saved a year's worth of expenses, not a year's worth of lifestyle. <laughs> but I see. Yeah, you might have to go eat steaks every day, like bologna sandwiches every day. Exactly. So I, I saved a year's worth of expenses. Um, and I learned to stretch to two years. Um, because if you don't have that safety net, you're going to go seek that safety net out somewhere else. So I saved the money um, before I ever started the company. And that I still view as my saving grace because that was my safety net the whole time. That was the only way. Um, I was able to go through the really hard times, um, was because I knew that at least my livelihood wasn't at stake, but I will say when I started my company, I also knew shout out to Starbucks again, that I would just go become a barista at Starbucks if I needed yeah, to <laughs> you know, go work with DoorDash. Exactly. Maybe like sell blood, yep. sell cans. I mean, I mean, are you hearing like pound and square, the signs everywhere, restaurants hiring $15 an hour. Yeah thousand dollar bonuses right exactly exactly what's my expect to do you know you're trying to build a business you know but hey exactly but yeah that's that's what bootstrapping is so what advice do you have someone who wants to be an entrepreneur um if you want besides to be, don't do it don't do it and get a mental health check <laughs> uh I, I have two pieces of advice first the word entrepreneur is used so loosely that very few people actually understand what it takes to be a founder. Um, and I would al almost rather use the word founder over entrepreneur because you can be in an MLM and people call you an entrepreneur. I mean, you know, it kills me. Like people are like, I have a real estate, I'm a real estate agent. I'm an entrepreneur. No, no you're not. Or like, they're like, I'm a, I, have, I, own, I, I work a Chick-fil-A franchise. Yeah. No, you're not an entrepreneur. Exactly. And, and the thing is, is also you're not an entrepreneur when, you just have ideas, but you have no way to execute those ideas. I can't stand those types of entrepreneurs where they think that their idea is so brilliant that people will come work for free and build their idea for them, but then they'll reap all the benefits. That's BS to me. If you have an idea and you learn how to execute that idea yourself, that's a lot more entrepreneurial. So I guess my first piece of advice is know what an entrepreneur really is. An entrepreneur, in my opinion, 
is a founder, a person who is the last person to take money out of the company, only after everybody else gets paid and you've secured everybody else's job and livelihood. An entrepreneur is somebody who risks everything for potential reward in the distant future, not the near future. Um, and an entrepreneur is somebody who empowers other people to grow and build their families and move up in their careers. Um, so if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to understand that that's an 80 hour a week job. It's not a 40 hour a week job. It's definitely not less than 40 hours a week. Um, and you're not going to get rich quick. If you want to be an entrepreneur, the best entrepreneurs, in my opinion, are the ones who know how to perform every single role in their business and have spent at least a month at minimum performing that role before hiring for that role. Um, my preference would be you're spending six months performing that role before you hire for that role. Um, that's what you need to do if you want to bootstrap and create a successful company where your employees respect you and want to work for you. But you brought up a good point, right? Like, for example, I know you get it. Like, at one point, you had 30 people. Like, I know you realize you have 30 people work for you. Not only 30 people, you have 30 families, right? 30 families. Yeah. These 30 families depend on you doing business, getting, selling your company so they can pay their mortgage, put food on the table. I think so many people don't get that right. They don't realize decisions they make or don't make affect all these different people. You make the wrong decisions as a CEO or founder or whatever. You know, how am I making a mortgage payment? Or yep. you, I hope you don't get that right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, a great example of this is I mentioned earlier, um, I was at one of my old employees' um, weddings about two months ago now. It was at the end of July. And that actually, for me, was the culmination of Killer. That, that wedding, as I watched him do his vows, uh, one of my other old employees was the officiant. Um, and this employee was one of the first of my first lot that I W2'd. Um, I had hired him in 2012. Um, so we we're so young as a company. Watching him get married. Um, I've been to several weddings. I've watched several kids born. I am the aunt to several uh, kids from the killer family now. Um, but at, at this wedding, particularly, it was kind of the final bow on killer for me because the reward of seeing all these people who I knew in their very early twenties, where I was supposed to be their first job for a couple of years. And then they stuck around for over a decade into a merger, went through the merger, learned in that merger as well. In that time, met their spouses, had kids, watching this evolution take place and being able to say, I helped make that happen because I provided some stability in your life. And that stability gave you the freedom to explore these things. It's the most rewarding thing ever of a founder, in my opinion. Um, and so while I've been to several weddings, I think this was I think the last of the crew for the most part, um, hopefully there will be a few more, but this was one of the last and one of my longest time employees. And so that was for me, this moment where I was like, cool, now the killer chapter's closed. What's the next chapter? Yeah. You, this is a good point. Like, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they look at success the wrong way. They think it's proper, right? I have a cousin, Margo, her husband, Bubba, they saw an electrical company in San Antonio a while ago, right? Mm -hmm. They went from two people to have a hundred people working now. Wow. And like, you know, of course, like 75 block houses, like advancements, all this kind of stuff yep. all over Central Texas. Like, and like, man, that's like great, you no know, great metric of success, right? Like, and then like you've hired these people, they're buying houses, but value members of the community. You know, too many people are like, oh, I'm making profit, right? Mm. I think you have to look at success a different way. Yeah, the profit is the people. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I think we really tried to focus on as a company was people over profits. Um, and any time that would shift, because there would be periods that shifted, uh, an agency is feast or famine. And in the times that shifted, the whole morale shifted. Um, when you put people over profits, you have an amazing experience. Um, when profits drive all of your decisions, it's, it's at the sacrifice of people. So it was, it's a, it's a line that you tow as a business owner, 
Um, but we would always try really hard to focus on the people over profits. So for market agencies, is it like a, a month that's like really good, really bad? And like, how do you balance that out? Yeah. Is it the same every year? I think there is a seasonality to it for sure. Um, in my opinion, the seasonality almost follows the school year. Um, so when parents are home with their kids, they're not thinking about going into work and hiring an agency for anything. When um, parents know that their kids are in school and taken care of, then their mind starts focusing on projects at work and what agencies they need to hire. So I think there's a seasonality that kind of follows the school, the school year. Um, but also once we recognize that seasonality, then we started saying, how do we hire our primary? How do we land clients where their fiscal year ends in the middle of the summer so that we can have, you know, much more powerful summers because if their fiscal year ends in the, in the middle of the summer, then that means they're spending all their money in June just trying to ensure they get new budgets um, in July that match their previous year. So we started mixing our clients where half of our clients, their fiscal year ended at the end of the calendar year, half of them ended in um, at the end of June. As a result, that would lead to about three powerful quarters. We'd still have a slump quarter. Q3 was often a slump quarter, no matter what we would do. Um, it didn't matter who our clients were. And I think it's because that's just the peak of summer, but there's a seasonality and there is feast or famine. And that's the issue with so many agencies. Cause when you have 30 employees, you're paying those salaries, whether you're making an income or not. And that's why a lot of agencies scale up and scale down with freelancers so that during the famine time, they aren't having to pay out a bunch of salaries. And that was definitely, you know, I was so stuck on keeping everybody in house and I'm still proud of that. Was it the best business decision? No, not at all, but it was the best decision for me and my team. So on average, how long would a client stay with you? Um, because we were based on designing the content for them and then they would um, then take the content to market maybe with another agency, which is another reason we went into the material family so that we could avoid that. Um, it used to be, um, I mean, we had clients who stayed with us for all 10 years, but they would just come to us on a project by project basis. Okay. So we'd be really selling three month projects, six month projects, things like that. And some projects were just two week projects. Um, but when you have a holistic agency like Material, where they're really, they can be with a brand from the ground up, um, and they can really come in and reimagine an entire company or reimagine a product line or build a product line for the company. Um, that's exciting. And that was what excited all of us um, and why so many of my people are still thriving there today because it's, those are long-term projects, long-term commitments, multi-year campaigns where you really build a camaraderie with your client and this whole other team, this external team with your client, um, where you're going through things together. You're on a roller coaster together of, of a lot of creativity and excitement. Um, so big agencies like material have the ability to do that because they have the staff and the expertise to do that. Small fledgling agency is a little bit harder. Who's like material, like so-called like perfect customer, so to speak. Um, Gosh, I feel like there are so many lines that work really well for material um, because material is, um, they try to hit every end of the uh, product and brand development journey. Um, so you could be a company like Microsoft. Let's use Microsoft as an example. Let's say Microsoft is going to launch a brand new product. Um, Let's say it's uh, the new Zune. Uh, no, that's really dating myself there, but you get it. Uh, so let's say Microsoft is about to launch a brand new product. Well, to launch a new product, you need to know the name of that product. You need to know the brand behind that product. You need to know who's the target customer for this product. You need to know where you got to launch that product first. You need to understand how to design the product itself. What's the physical design of the product? 
And then once you've done all of that work, which of course material does, then you need to start building the go-to-market campaign for that product. And then once you've done all that work, well, then you need to build the remarketing campaign and the customer loyalty campaign for that product. So it is a whole cycle for a brand. And so material fits really well with companies that are either starting out in that cycle, or maybe they've gotten a little bit through that cycle and they realize that their current um, provider isn't giving them what they need. So they need to kick things up a notch and find somebody who's proven. And material is proven. I mean, the stuff that has come out of the agencies that formed material um, are some absolutely amazing everyday brands. And the um, minds behind it are all still at material. So you have all these agencies that sold into material. Well, all those creative minds are still there. So you have this um, just ridiculous amount of historical knowledge that can be put into any company that is really trying to engage and keep customers. Did material come to you or you went to material? I went to material. Okay. So you were ready to like sell your company, so to speak. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. So next, I got to bring it up real fast. Um, so material, like how many of your, your former employees are still with material? Um, at least 60%. And 60%. we, yeah. And we sold in 2018. Okay. So that's pretty good for the life cycle of a, an employee in the design industry in general. Has it ever happened where like a former employee comes to you and says, Hey, Amy, man, material sucks that I do this right. And you got to kind of like walk them back from that. And like, you know, actually this is a good company. Like this, but like we look this. I think that it's impossible to go from so like Amy, they're not you. Exactly. I think it's impossible to go from a team of 30 to a team of thousands and not have moments of frustration because when it's instant bureaucracy, right? Yeah. When, when the CEO is the first person you can go to complain to, which is what killer was. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you're so removed from even your manager. That's a hard pill to swallow. Um, at the same time, it's the price you pay to be able to take on the challenges of um, the projects and campaigns that we all wanted to take on. Now, the employees, what kind of benefit they get? They get like increasing salary like, or like, okay, so it's like financially beneficial, job beneficial. So, yeah, I mean, so many ways that it's beneficial. Um, in, in, if anything else, it's a resume builder in the very, very least. Um, but yes, salaries, better bonuses, better benefit packages, um, having offices all around the world that you can go work out of. Um, and I think the biggest thing, and this is the real, like the, the real driver for me, this is why I wanted to do it. Killer had a ceiling. There wasn't, I mean, I had exceptionally talented people who. But where's the career growth, right? Yeah. They could have been a creative director anywhere, but I already had a creative director. Um, and so the only answer to give them career protection and longevity was to grow. And I personally didn't have it in me to grow the company on my own. I wanted something like this. I wanted a, either an investment group that was going to invest in our growth or a team of like-minded agencies that all had the same excitement. And that's what we found. And finding a roll-up like that, I mean, roll-ups are traditional in the agency space, but rare these days. So finding a roll-up like that was um, like finding a unicorn. So I have a good friend, Mary Rossi. She had a company called Creative Design. I think it's called, right? Like, doing like we did, right? And out of the blue, she had a call from Sims. Mm -hmm. And it offered the job to redesign Sims, right? Oh, nice. And it's like, I don't remember, but I can't turn this down, right? Yeah. And like, like, so it's been like three years. She said it's going to do like two years and leave. She's still there, right? She's like, like how you turn down opportunity to redesign, I kind of can't write that. Right. Like, so I can't do it, right? And she's still there, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. In the end, I think that creatives run towards creative challenges. Um, they want to be able to show their mark on the world. Um, and that's the, that's the opportunity I wanted to give my team. So I could talk about this. Like me. I have no creativity in my mind. Like if you try to draw something, I draw a stick figure, it's ugly. 
I'm an introvert, right? So me, I try my best. Like, how am I going to look at how I'm an introvert? Like, we're supposed to stay in the room and not to say anything, right? So I do my best to hire, like, extroverts or creative, right? Mm -hmm. And you talk about the importance, like, hiring, a, like, a people who don't think like you. Oh, yes. You have to hire people that don't think like you. Um, and I will say, I mainly met a bunch of introverted creatives, just so you know. Um, but if I only hired people who thought like me, we never would have got off the ground. Um, you need to hire people like, just cause I knew how to do the job didn't mean there weren't people out there who could do it far better than I could. I'm going to use project management as an example. I hate project management, but I can do it really well if I have to, but I hate it. Um, I hired people who not only loved it, but could do it so much better than me that they taught me to so much that now I can say I can do it really well. I don't think I could have at the time, but now I do feel like I can because they taught me so much. Um, but I also had to learn that there's a personality type that somebody who's a project manager has that might be different than somebody who's an animator. And when you know the difference in personality types, you give them different tools to succeed. So that's also very important. Um, but you should always hire people who know better than you do and who think differently than you do, because that way they can challenge you. And if you're not open to challenge, don't be an entrepreneur. You need to be open to challenge. Um, still to this day, some of my best friends started as employees, actually started as interns, then became employees, then moved up the executive ladder and are my biggest confidants today because they challenged me so well and they know how I think better than I do. So how, how does it work for you? Like, suppose you, you have your 30 people working for you. You bring someone on, they're brand new. How long did it take for you? How do you figure out, okay, John Bob has that potential. Mm -hmm. I need to like invest in him. Or Tom has no potential. I don't need to waste my time with him. I, don't, I know it's a better way to say it right, but how do you like determine like who to invest and like, like grow, so to speak, versus, okay, he's just here for an hour five. Like an example, like, how do you determine like someone, I'm only making $30 versus someone, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making $30, but I don't want to add value, right? How do you like determine that? Honestly, it was in the interview process because we only had, and it was a bit into the company, we had like one person who it was clear they were just there to make their money and run. And then one day they just didn't show up for work. And we were like, okay, cool. Like that was, they were, we were considering firing them because they just weren't, um, performing the way we expected. And we had the night before brought up a pip and the next day you didn't just didn't show up to work. We we're like, okay, cool. So we only had one person. I, I, thank you for making the decision. For yeah. We only had one person I, with I, that I, attitude. I, I appreciate you. Exactly. Um, and the reason we only had one person with that attitude was because of the questions we asked in the interview process. So we focused on making sure that we were bringing people on board who had the attitude of as long as we fulfilled our promise as a company, they would fulfill theirs and want to give as much as we gave. Um, so I didn't have that issue as much, but again, I only had 30 people. And I think when you have um, hundreds of people, it's a lot easier for people to become a cog in a wheel instead of a wheel. Um, but sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need a certain amount of cogs in a wheel. And if they don't want to be invested in, that's totally fine yeah. because they're performing their job and that's the type of job they wanted. And it's perfect for everybody involved. Um, but when you're only 30 people, you can't have a cog in a wheel. You can't have somebody like that. Um, as a result, we were, I mean, our, our average interview took four hours to interview somebody for the job. I mean, like if you work at Microsoft, you're better hire. Okay. That's okay. But if you have a company with 30 people, you have a bad hire that destroys the company, right? Answer. Yeah. It's, it's the worst thing ever. If you have bad hire. I have a good friend working at one of the big companies here. He told me like, he like Jason at this company, I know people who try to get fired and then won't we'll fire him. Like they purposely like, they purposely fuck up on purpose. Yep. And we'll get rid of him, right? Exactly. It's like a office space. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So who are your mentors? Um, honestly, it's my parents. Um, my parents, I, I feel like I've kind of mentioned most of them. Um, obviously, uh, you know, my, my, teacher, uh, John Mercer and Ruth Mercer, uh, who taught me how to do public speaking, um, will always go down in the history books as some of my best mentors I ever had. Um, 
my parents, I still will go to for advice on a regular basis. Um, and they've always been mentors. I'll go to my brother for advice if I need, um, if I need something, especially because now he's, um, doing sales at a creative agency now. And as a result, we have a lot in common, um, when it comes to career advice. Um, so definitely I'll, I'll go to my brother. Um, but I think most importantly, and definitely throughout the entirety of killer, my wife, my wife is the best. She, she gives the best advice anybody could ever get, especially when it comes to business. And she'll always say that she's not business minded, but she worked in business insurance for a decade and saw every lawsuit come across her desk. So she knew what worked and what didn't and how to make sure we were doing right by everybody. Um, and so she's always been my best guide and not just in business and everything in life. Follow question to me, the more important part of the question, who are you mentoring? Um, that's a good question because I don't know if people see me as their mentor or not. I don't have any like specific mentor mentee relationship. Um, but I would like to think that I've had that opportunity, um, to mentor my employees in the past, um, where there's been a lot of, um, a lot of advice given. I have one, um, old employee who just started her own branding agency. And so, um, we have gotten the opportunity to meet up once so far and talk about it. And I hope we get to meet up again very soon. We keep on trying to find time to meet up and talk about it. So I'm doing what I can to give her advice, but she's so talented that, um, she doesn't need a bunch of my advice. Um, so I, I definitely, you know, reach out like that. And then, um, there's somebody I'm talking to on LinkedIn right now who I recently met at content marketing world who has her own agency and is looking for some advice on, um, ensuring that her agency follows the right visual style for the clients and everything. So, um, I'm going to continue to talk with her and hopefully give her as much advice as I can. Um, but really when people come to me, I have, I have random people email me asking for advice on LinkedIn all the time. And the minute I have time to catch up on LinkedIn, I'm jumping in and telling them whatever I can. So when people reach out with questions, I try to help. And if ever anybody said specifically to me, I want you to be my mentor, then I would sit down with them and actually come up with like a program or something. So talk about the points of your spouse or your close family or close friends supporting you as an entrepreneur. Talk, talk about what specifically you, you, about them. Like your spouse, mm -hmm. like supporting you oh, or your geez. family supporting you. Like, you know, that's the unique, like have your spouse, like, I know you're doing this entrepreneur thing, but can you get a job? Right. You know, like, can you talk about the points of that? I mean, the, the biggest and most important thing, and I've noticed this with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you have two routes that an entrepreneur will go down if they're married. One route is it's my career and I'm going to do what I want to do. And then they alienate their spouse. And I've seen this happen a lot. I've seen, especially if they become more and more successful as entrepreneurs, they alienate, their, they alienate their spouse even more. Maybe they have kids and their spouse becomes the caretaker of the kids. Um, and it eventually will lead to a divorce. It is not good. Um, with my wife and I, we sat down before starting the company and we made a lot of agreements. We made rules. Um, we, we agreed on what triggers would have to happen to make me stop and go get a job at Starbucks or whatever. Um, and we didn't have kids. And that was for us a very important aspect of it because um, we knew that this was going to take a lot of time. But we also had to have a lot of open communication. I know a lot of entrepreneurs who don't bring their work home and don't tell their spouses about what's working and what's not. Um, in some relationships, that works really well. In ours, that was not the way um, we wanted it to go. Plus, I'm very bad at, at just like leaving work at work. It comes home with me. Um, and so she knew everything. I looped her in on every last thing with the company. And as a result, she had the knowledge to then come to me with advice and help empower me and support me. And if you don't share everything with your spouse, you're not going to get the support that you need. It is very lonely at the top. You need to have somebody there supporting you and empowering you and on and in your corner. Um, that's exactly what my wife has been for me. 
Um, but we also agreed very early on what outcomes we wanted from this. It was, you know, probably about six years in where we said, we're going to go all in on me public speaking. My wife quit her job so that she could travel with me for public speaking because we knew that I was going to be gone 40 weeks out of the year and um, that it was important that we um, weren't in a long distance relationship. Yeah, like are you really married? Like you separated that much? Exactly. So um, she quit her job to go along with me at a time when I wasn't making a ton of money. So we knew we had to um, really bring our, our payments down. Again, this is why we missed our, our, we missed our window in the Seattle housing market. We really did. We, that's why you, not, that's really, why you we, feel 900 square foot. Of yeah, time. exactly. We got stuck with it. Um, but yeah, so we, um, we, we just constantly remained open in our communication and resetting our agreements as well. But it all was based on an agreed outcome, which was how do we build a lifestyle that lets us spend as much time with each other as possible and as much time with our families as possible. Um, and that is what we did. And that's why we made all the decisions we made was to build the lifestyle that we currently have today. So something personal, you all plan on having a kid? Nope. <laughs> no kid. We wanted to be ants our whole lives. Okay. Now we are extremely happy ants, thanks to um, my sister and thanks to my brother, both having kids. Um, and yeah, we're we're thrilled to be ants. Okay. <laughs> we 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 were cat parents for 16 years. That was also enough. Okay. So you, you said before you want to be like the the, the future guy Kawasaki. How you say his name? Kawasaki. Yeah. How, what's your plan for doing that? Right. Write and create content, um, but stay, stay in the know as well. Um, I mean, I, I'll use AI again as an example. AI is advancing so fast that being a thought leader in AI is not the easiest thing to do at all because you create a presentation and then you go up on stage and, oh, look, everything changed in the last week and now I need to like change everything in my presentation. Um, so for me, it's, I want to keep putting content out there. Um, I love doing LinkedIn learning courses. C uh, committing to three courses this year was my biggest commitment. Um, a single course is like writing a book. Uh, I have to write about 40,000 words to write the whole script. And then I have to film the whole thing. Um, and then I have to edit the whole thing and add all the animations um, and then turn it in. And the whole time I've got a producer checking on it, making sure you know, I'm doing everything right by LinkedIn standards. Um, I always have to pitch what courses I'm going to do and we have to work together to make sure it's the right course. Um, so the three courses this year was equivalent to writing three books. I wrote about 120,000 words and then had to do all the filming and, and editing and animating for them. Um, so, so, so how yeah. did that happen? Like they reach out to you, you reach out to them or like how that work and they, they, they pay you, how that how's that all the work? Yeah. So it started in 2013. Um, when they reached when, out, when they call like, was it when they, it like, was Linda, Linda, Linda. Yeah. 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 So it was Linda.com at the time. And actually it might've been 2014 or even 2015. Um, cause it wasn't my first time speaking at Adobe max. Um, but basically I was speaking at Adobe max and they came up to me after and, um, said to me, Hey, we'd like to see if you want to be one of our instructors. Maybe you can do um, a course on infographic design. And that's when I learned about the fact that, oh, like you guys go out and recruit and that's how they were doing it. They were going to conferences, finding good speakers and that let them know, okay, here's somebody who's in the professional field instead of like a skill share where anybody can produce the content and there's no quality check on it. Um, Linda, Linda.com, now LinkedIn Learning was very focused on making sure these were experts in the field. And having a very hands-on production process to really make sure that the content's high quality. So um, I did my first course for them and uh, they flew me down to um, Santa Barbara. They have a, their headquarters in Carpinteria, um, beautiful campus and uh, shot everything in studio. Um, and then pitched another course and another course. Um, when I was down there, my very first time filming, I met a man named David Blattner. He runs Creative Pro. Um, Creative Pro does four or five conferences a year um, that are all um, very, very well attended. 
um, conferences on hands-on design skills. Um, he lives in Woodenville, actually. Um, I met him down there and he was telling me that he was on his like 10th course. And I thought, wait, you can do a lot of courses here. And I was starting to learn watching him. So that was my next goal was I want to be David Blattner. Um, <laughs> and he's an amazing guy. Talk about an extremely smart man um, with just such a rich history. And I, I should list him as a mentor, honestly, that there's a mentor right there. Um, so in any event, um, I started saying, wait, I can keep creating LinkedIn con well, Linda content, then LinkedIn, um, and maybe make this a large part of my career as well. So that became my focus then was how many courses can I produce? And now my goal will always be to have a minimum of 10 up-to-date courses yeah. at a time. Um, I, I can have 20, 30 courses, but 10 that are really, um, based on current trends and, and um, current tools because everything's going to get dated after a yeah. while. Um, so LinkedIn is great. I, I love doing that and I, I do get royalties from it. So it is like writing a book. They okay. call their instructors authors um, because it is a lot like writing a book. And I can you can imagine the work you got to put into it. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot. And you get royalties like a book. Um, and then, yeah, my, my goal is, keep up with that because I made a whole career on the fact that people don't read, but I love to write. <laughs> and so I will keep writing books, but I understand more people are going to want to watch my LinkedIn courses than read probably. Um, but I can't stop myself from writing. I love writing. Um, it's been a passion of mine forever. I think in fourth grade, I told everybody I'd be an author one day. So. So talk about this, right? I, I use the example all the time, right? So when the iPod first came out, like there was so many things better than it. Like, I mean, I mean, I, I'm making this up, but iPod was actually like middle of the pack, right? Yeah. But all these other companies, they'll say, we have 2.5 stores, 9.2 this, three, all these tech stats, right? Steve Jobs, you're on the stage, thousand songs in pocket. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the points like saying like something simple like that when you're brand new, doing market, like something simple as like thousand songs in pocket and how so many people don't get that wrong. I mean, honestly, it comes back to this idea of like, there's lies, damn lies and statistics. Um, people don't know how to use numbers in their favor, period. And Steve Jobs always knew how to use numbers in his favor. Um, and so ultimately we, we live in a world where you can manipulate the data and use numbers, um, incorrectly all the time. Um, so if you want to really get somebody's attention, it's about how does that number impact somebody's life? And that's what Steve Jobs really knew. He knew how to accurately represent numbers um, and give the right context, but use them to show how that impacted your life specifically. Like there's a thousand songs or a million songs in your pocket. Um, it was just honestly a great value proposition in the end. Yeah. Like, like I tell people all the time, like whatever you're doing, what is your thousand songs in the pocket? Like yeah. thing, right? What is that? You got to figure that out, right? Exactly. It's the idea that it goes back to, um, uh, the idea of think differently. Yeah. yeah you know, uh, yeah. the, um, the brand promise. Like of, all the good market, market, like just do it, you know, yeah. all the like great marketing things that are so simple, right? Yep. That was so for killer. We, um, got on a whole, uh, kind of bent about what's our think differently. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually works. If you come up with just a couple of words and make all your decisions based on that, it does actually lead to some great decisions. So ours was speak visually. Yeah. And once we did speak nice visually, simple. yeah. Yeah. Like we, that. We knew what to say no to mm -hmm. from a project perspective. Um, because we were saying yes to too many projects that didn't really fit the mold of our expertise. But speak visually was what we did very, very, very well. And so we'd say no to a web design project because mm -hmm. that wasn't that was that was speak interactively. Yeah. It wasn't speak visually, you know? So I do think that having that brand promise really makes sense. Is there a skill you don't have now that you wish you, wish you had, that you wish you had? Yes. Yes. There are several skills I don't have now that I wish I had. Um, I desperately want to learn 3d design. That's something I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, prior to the fact that you can basically code almost anything with AI. Now I wanted to learn, learn Ruby on rails cause I've been like slowly going through the stack. Um, but now I just want to learn how to code AI. 
yeah. specifically because I feel like yeah, that's how we're all gonna like have some control in the future is knowing how to code it, not just prompt it. Um, so those are the skills I'm really digging into right now. Yeah, I know we talked earlier about like teaching everyone how to fight and like defend themselves. Mm -hmm. But like if you're a parent and you're like your kids in kindergarten, first grade, you gotta teach them how to code. Yes. Like you have to, I mean, like you have to teach them how to code. Exactly. Like, I mean, it's, it basically has another foreign language, right? You have to teach your kids how to code. Yep. If you want them to survive going forward, like they have to code. Yeah. Something. Although that might not be true 10 years from now. That's yeah. the thing is That's 10 true. years from now, AI might be doing all the coding for us, which is why it's like learning how to code AI yeah. is, is maybe the strongest of the code languages. So learning lar uh, large language models and stuff like that. But also I kind of go back to hard skills, carpentry. Yeah. The, the things that AI won't ever be able to do. And gosh, I would love to learn some good carpentry. <laughs> I am so bad at hammering things. <laughs> I am sitting here right now. Um, my nail finally grew back, but I hammered my nail down back in uh, uh, July. And only a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. did it come back. It was, I'm bad at carpentry, but I desperately want to learn. So Amy, is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have asked you anything else you want to talk about? Honestly, I think we hit on a lot of great things. I don't think I have any other, I'm always bad at answering that question too. <laughs> um, I'm bad at coming up with questions, period. I'm not a good interviewer. But I, <laughs> I always, I, I always um, am impressed when people are so good at asking questions and interviewing. Yeah. Um, so can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm primarily on LinkedIn. Um, I am not on any other social media. I had to quit all social media in 2020 because it was sending me down a very bad rabbit hole with my Midwest family, um, whom I love and didn't like social media. Um, so yeah, I am a hundred percent on LinkedIn. Um, and that was very anti Midwest. I love the Midwest. <laughs> I, that was not to do with anything. Just, just a few, a few people were posting things I didn't like. That's funny. Uh, can you give us any last minute advice on wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I guess the biggest thing would just simply be the idea of in the world of our careers, because we've been talking about careers so much, you have this concept of like, do what you love, love what you do. I think we have to adjust that concept as people. I think that find a group of people who you enjoy working with and are willing to sludge through the hard days together, knowing that you're not always going to love what you do, but if you can bring some good into the world from time to time with what you do, that's the company and job that's worth working at. Um, and put in the hours if, they, if you're receiving the right output from the company you're working with. Amy, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it as well. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.